I'm going to call this meeting of the Assembly Judiciary Committee to order. Mr. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Here. Assemblywoman Hardy? Here. Assemblywoman Kasama? Here. Assemblywoman Krasner? As Assemblywoman Marzala? Assemblyman Miller? Here. Sorry. Here. Assemblywoman Wen? Here. Assemblyman O'Neill? Here. Assemblyman Orant Liquor? Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong? And Assembly, Assemblyman Wheeler? Here. And Chairman Yeager? Here. Uh, we do have a quorum. Um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead, uh, please, and mark Assemblywoman Krasner and Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong present when they arrived. They both did inform me they were running a little bit late this morning. Uh, so I expect them to arrive momentarily. I want to remind um, everyone on the Zoom, I think we've been living in this world for quite a while, but if you can remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking, it really does help uh, with the feedback. And if someone forgets, um, I'll try to remind you to do that, and hopefully I'll remember it myself. So we have a few items on our agenda today, um, as I'm sure you've had a chance to see and you know, obviously want to welcome you to Assembly Judiciary Committee, uh, the second day of the session. I think we are one of the first committees in the building to actually go forward. Um, so welcome to the committee. Uh, a lot of you know me already, but uh, my name is Steve Yeager and I represent Assembly District 9, which is located in Southwest Las Vegas. Um, I am again honored that Speaker Frierson has chosen me to chair this committee. Uh, this will be the third consecutive session I have chaired Assembly Judiciary and it's not lost on me what a privilege that is. I believe the last member to chair this committee that many times in a row was the late great Bernie Anderson, whose daughter is now one of our legislative colleagues. Since then, chairs of this committee have included the former Majority Leader William Horn, our current speaker, Jason Frierson, and now Senator Ira Hansen, whose better half currently serves on this committee with us as well. I have big shoes to fill, I know that, but I will do my best to fill them. Um, as you can tell by the fact that we're conducting this hearing remotely, this session is going to be unlike any other uh, we have ever had. But that's not gonna stop us from doing our work. We are traditionally one of the busiest committees in this building, and we hear important and often controversial policy bills in this committee. I certainly expect that to continue this session I also expect that we will demonstrate the best of this legislative institution through the way that we treat each other and others appearing in front of the committee. I have no doubt that all of us want the best for Nevada. We may sometimes disagree on how to get there and that's perfectly okay. We can disagree, but as Speaker Frierson said yesterday, we don't have to be disagreeable when we're doing that. We must always remember to treat each other with respect and those appearing in front of this committee with respect as well, whether virtually or otherwise. If we can do that, I have no doubt at all that our constituents will be proud of how we have conducted ourselves up here in Carson City. So before we get started with the agenda this morning, um, I wanted to start with the introduction of members and staff. So members, uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm just gonna call out uh, the members based on uh, the returning members and then the new members. And when I call you out, if you wouldn't mind um, unmuting yourself uh, just state your name, your district, tell us where in the state your district is, and uh, tell us why you wanted to be on judiciary. I guess if in fact you did want to be on judiciary. Uh, if you didn't want to be on the committee, maybe you could make up um, a good reason. So uh, with that being said, um, I'm going to go first to our vice chair, uh, Assemblywoman Rochelle Wynn. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Rochelle Wynn. I represent Assembly District 10 
it is in the heart of Las Vegas. It is in central Las Vegas and um, in the, primarily in the medical district right there by U, um, UMC. I, this is my second session and my second session on assembly judiciary. I love this committee. I think it's fantastic and I love the issues that come before it. Not because I, not only because I do it in private practice, but also because um, we are making some of the biggest policy decisions for our state. And um, I love the diverse group of people that are on this committee and I look forward to the upcoming Thank you, Assemblywoman Wynn. And, you know, members, I'm going to do my best to make myself available to any of you uh, if you need something. But if for some reason I'm not available, please seek out uh, Vice Chair Wynn. Uh, I know she'll make herself available as well. And I'm, I'm really counting on her to help with a lot of the work we have to do. So welcome back to the committee. Um, we're going to go next to, uh, we're still on our returning committee members. We'll go next to Assemblywoman Leslie Cohen, who uh, you'll have to remind us, Assemblywoman Cohen, how many sessions for you this is for judiciary. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm uh, very excited to be here. I'm Leslie Cohen. I represent Assembly District 29, which is in uh, mostly in Henderson, the older part of Green Valley into downtown Henderson, and then a sliver of Silverado Ranch. Uh, this is my fourth uh, uh, term on judiciary, and it's my first legislative love. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice, and I, I just find the topics that we cover in this committee so important for the state and so interesting uh, as well. So very happy to be back. Great. Thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen. And I think that might make you the ranking member on the committee in terms of sessions, but we'll, we'll get that solidified here in a moment. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, Assemblyman Jim Wheeler, who I think might have somewhere approaching the number of, of sessions you have. Uh, so you'll have to remind us. Please go ahead, Assemblyman Wheeler. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, this actually will be my fourth session uh, on judiciary. I represent District 39, which I think is probably one of the more conservative districts in the state. And uh, happy to do that with Douglas County, Story County, and a, a large portion of, uh, or I'm sorry, a small portion of uh, Lyon County. So when you go up to the lake, guys, uh, all you new guys, you're in my district. So please spend lots of money up there. We really appreciate that when you guys come up. Um, I took a brief hiatus in the last session where I uh, slept through, I mean, was on Ways and Means. And uh, I'm glad to be back on judiciary. I think with all that's going on in the world right now, as far as law enforcement, some of our judicial laws, uh, uh, reform, et cetera. This is going to be the committee where things are happening and where more, most of the important things happen in this session. So I'm happy and proud to be back here and thank you for having me back on, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Assemblyman Wheeler. So I think we see that Assemblyman Wheeler and Assemblywoman Cohen are uh, both the ranking members with the most experience on Judiciary Committee with four sessions. So you can certainly go to them with questions as well. So staying on our returning members, I want to go next to Assemblywoman. Uh, well, let me ask if she's on. I'm not sure if Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner has made it onto the Zoom yet. So if so, please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll come back to her. We, we will come back to Assemblywoman Krasner. So let's go next to um, Assemblywoman Alexis Hansen, who I think is joining us uh, for her second session on the Judiciary Committee. So please go ahead, Assemblywoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's nice to see all of you. Um, this is my second session as a legislator and my second session being on Judiciary, and I appreciate the opportunity to serve again. It was, I asked for it, and I'm, I'm so thrilled that I was able to serve again on Judiciary. Um, I represent District 32. There's a map behind me. Um, I live in Sparks and I um, represent seven counties. So there, it's 38,000 square miles, one of the largest assembly districts in the lower 48 states. And I love it. Um, I live in Sparks, so I have the a large chunk of Washoe County from Sparks going up to the border. I have uh, Lander, Humboldt, Pershing, Mineral, Esmeralda, and a large chunk of Nye County that includes Tonopah, where I lived as a little girl at one time in my life. And then I've had an interest in the law 
Um, my dad was the DA of Eureka County for over 30 years and Esmeralda County, which is in my district. Um, my father passed away in 2000, but um, his spirit lives on and I've always had kind of an interest in the law and I find serving on judiciary an opportunity to really delve into issues um, and, and, and really have some good takeaways. And so I, I'm honored to be here, so thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hanson, and welcome back to the committee. I'm staying on our returning members. I'll go next to Assemblyman P.K. O'Neill, who uh, served on this committee in 2015 before I was elected, and he took a couple sessions off, but now he is uh, back again with us on Assembly Judiciary. So please go ahead and introduce yourself, Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, sir, Mr. Chair. Maybe I don't have to say anything after that introduction from you. Um, I represent Assembly District 40, Carson City, in the southeast part of Washoe County. I served on judiciary in 2015, actually with Mr. Hanson, or Miss Hanson's uh, husband, and I'm happy to be back. Actually, I asked for this because I figured 40 years in law enforcement, I had to balance off all the attorneys. Uh, so I want to thank you and I look forward to being with you. I do know that this is the committee, the busiest committee that we have in the assembly as far as I'm concerned. So we got a lot of work in front of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Assemblyman O'Neill. Um, we'll come back to Assemblywoman Krasner in just a moment, but I want to go to our new committee members. We have quite a few new committee members joining us um, this session. So I'm going to start first with Assemblywoman uh, Shannon Bilbray Axelrod. Assemblywoman, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Shannon Bilbray Axelrod, and I serve uh, Assembly District 34, which is in Northwest Las Vegas. Um, I go from, uh, if you know where the College of, of Southern Nevada is, um, just that's right outside my district up into Desert Shores, part of Summerlin. So uh, it's a, the best part of, of Las Vegas, I believe. Um, I have not served on this committee before, although this is my third session. Uh, I actually served on government affairs the last two terms. Uh, and, but I'm excited. I, I have found myself um, following along, going back and watching these um, committees in the past uh, on video because it, it really is one of those committees that um, really makes an impact in the lives of so many Nevadans. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the donuts, Chairman. So I, I know with COVID, it's, we won't have a wall, but I still hope that there'll be some donuts. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, uh, Assemblywoman. Obviously, you're no stranger to the building, and um, I know uh, serving under uh, the leadership of Assemblyman Flores, I'm sure, has uh, prepared you for judiciary. I'm, I've always been an admirer of how he runs government affairs, so uh, welcome, and we're happy to have you on the committee. So following along, uh, let's go next to um, one of our new members to the legislature, Assemblywoman Cecilia Gonzalez, representing District 16. Assemblywoman, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, hello, good morning, Judiciary Committee. My name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I'm very honored and excited to be here. I represent Assembly District 16 right in the beautiful Southern Nevada and heart, really, of our amazing city. I represent the Strip, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, going all the way to McCarran Airport. Again, very excited and honored to be here. Um, a lot of the uh, issues I care about come through ju judiciary, so I'm very excited to be here to learn from both Chair Yeager and Vice Chair Wynn as well. Thank you so much. Thank you and welcome to the committee. Uh, let's continue along and we're uh, we'll welcome to the committee for the first time, but not her first session in the legislature. Um, and that is Assemblywoman Melissa Hardy. Assemblywoman Hardy, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm very excited to be serving on this committee. I represent Assembly District 22, which is in Henderson. And um, it's pretty much the area around the Green Valley Ranch Hotel up into Anthem, um, a little bit of old Henderson. Uh, so that's my district. Um, I was born and raised in Las Vegas. And uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited to um, be on this committee and in the legislature in general is my father served in the legislature for 
almost 20 years and he was on um, assembly judiciary and then he chaired Senate judiciary for many, many years. So um, I grew up in the legal world talking about it, um, living in it. My family has always been involved um, in the legal field. I work for um, judge several judges and law firms. My daughter is currently in her last semester of law school at UNLV. So um, I really enjoy the, um, the issues and the topics that um, we're, that will be covered in judiciary and, and I'm just really excited to be on this committee. I too was on government affairs um, last session and just really have a passion for um, all things legal. So I'm really excited to be here and to serve with um, so many um, great people on this committee. So thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Welcome to the committee. I didn't know that the uh, Judiciary Committee was in your family history, so that's uh, very interesting and please um, extend uh, both our congratulations and condolences to your daughter in finishing up law school. That's, that's no easy feat. And uh, you know now the real work begins, but I'm sure she'll be uh, very successful in whatever she does. Thank you. So moving along, let's go to one of our new assembly members. Um, I'm gonna next ask Assemblywoman Heidi Kasama to introduce herself to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Yeager and Vice Chair Wynn. Um, um, thank you for having me on the committee committee delighted to be a part of it. Yes, I am a freshman to the assembly and a freshman to the judiciary. My background was uh, I was a CPA for 20 some years and run a real estate brokerage in uh, Las Vegas. Now my district assembly district two is on the west side of Las Vegas. If you know where downtown Summerlin is, if you draw kind of a big, uh, big circle, it's, it's of course a, a polygon, but if you have a big circle around downtown Summerlin, be my district, which I've lived in for many years, in 2002. And proud to represent the constituents. Um, uh, the the legal judiciary is is not been um, part of my background, as you hear. It's been more um, accounting and numbers. But I'm looking forward to um, serving with all of you, learning, and of course coming up with the best solutions for our state. So proud to serve with everybody. Thank you, Assemblywoman, and welcome to the committee. Um, I will say, I, I really enjoy my district, but your district has some of the best restaurants in Las Vegas as well, off of the no, Strip. So. No kidding. It's, it's like, I mean, I got five minutes around my house. I got the best restaurants. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so if uh, anyone down in Las Vegas or if our northerners are traveling down there, please reach out for restaurant recommendations that uh, are great food and off the Strip prices. So you can't uh, go I've wrong. got those. Yes, absolutely. A lot of chefs from uh, the casinos open their restaurants around there. So we got really great food. Fantastic. Well, welcome again to the committee. Uh, I'm going to go next to one of our, our new members and ask Assemblywoman Elaine Marzola to introduce herself to the committee. Good morning. Um, my name is Elaine Marzola and I represent Assembly District 21. Um, I have part of Henderson and some of Las Vegas. This is my first time serving. I'm super excited and very honored to be in judiciary. I'm a lawyer by trade. Um, so, you know, these issues are near and dear to my heart. Um, it's been a how I think we're going to do um, that we're going to be able to um, make a difference. Thank you, Assemblywoman, and um, welcome to the committee. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, another uh, one of our new members, and that is Assemblyman Cameron C.H. Miller. Assemblyman Miller, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, I, Cameron Miller, uh, you can call me C.H. or I guess Assemblyman Miller would be appropriate <laughs> um, within the committee. Um, I represent Assembly District 7, which is in the northern part of the Las Vegas Valley. Um, I have components of the city of Las Vegas as well as North Las Vegas in my district. I live in North Las Vegas. Um, I was born and raised uh, there in the Valley. And um, one of the reasons that I care, I cared about being on judiciary was a request of mine. Um, and that is about, um, well, one of the reasons is that it touches so many industries um, and for representation, uh, just wanna make sure that the uh, judicial process and so many of our laws that are created touch members of uh, my community in a unique way. Um, and so I just wanted to be a part of um, having a voice um, and a seat at the table. So thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Welcome to the committee. 
Um, I'm going to go next to another one of our uh, new members to the legislature, and that's Assemblyman David Orenlicker uh, from Assembly District 20. Uh, Assemblyman Orenlicker, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. It's great to be here. And, um, as uh, I'm just east of uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez dis District, I'm in District 20, so if you go east from UNLV campus in McCarran, to the interstate. So I've got a lot of uh, paradise and including Sunset Park and the northwest part of Henderson. It's my first time on judiciary in Nevada, but I've been on judiciary before in Indiana. It's a great committee. It's a natural fit because I teach at Boyd Law School, constitutional law and health law. And I've had the pleasure of having Kelsey Hardy, Melissa, Assemblywoman Hardy's daughter in classes uh, at the law school. So it's great to know that she's joining us this session and I'm looking forward to this uh, committee's work. Great, thank you, Assemblyman. Welcome to the committee. Um, I think we're still waiting for our other two members to join. So I think we'll probably come uh, back to them when we go through the rest of, of uh, the agenda. But, you know, I did wanna take a moment um, to just recognize our really tremendous committee staff that we have. Um, we are fortunate to have just a really talented and dedicated staff working for us this session to ensure that we're successful in our work. So at the outset, let me say uh, they are deserving of our respect, our admiration and our gratitude. Uh, we simply would not be able to conduct our business without the really important work that they do. And if you like the way that this committee runs um, and you're impressed by it, uh, it's certainly no credit to me. It's the staff behind the scenes that gets us ready for these meetings day in and day out. So, you know, as a result of that, I just wanna make abundantly clear to members uh, and members of the public that I will absolutely not tolerate any disrespect to our staff. They are here to help us and they should be thanked and appreciated. Um, I wanted to go ahead and just introduce some of our staff. Uh, normally we would be in a committee room together and you'd be able to see these folks face to face, but you know, here we are virtually. And so I'll, I'll do my best to, to introduce them and, and the ones that are on video, I'll just you know, ask if you can kind of wave as I introduce you. Um, first, I did wanna introduce, he, he's not on the screen and he's, he's hard at work in my office, but that is my um, assembly attache. Um, Avi Shulkoff. So uh, if you come to my office and I'm not there, you're going to run into Avi, who is um, out in the Judiciary Office. Uh, he, this is the first session he's serving as my attache. Um, he previously worked as an organizer for the Biden-Harris campaign in Las Vegas. He is a Los Angeles native and a University of Michigan graduate. So uh, I'm sure you'll meet him throughout, throughout this session and uh, you know, please say hello when you get a chance. As far as the LCB staff, um, we are really lucky to have so many returning this session uh, after multiple sessions. So we have a wealth of experience, starting with our committee policy analyst, Diane Thornton, who is on the Zoom with us. Um, this is her seventh legislative session and her fourth session as committee policy analyst for the Assembly Committee on Judiciary. So if you're following along, she's been on this committee longer than I have. So she, she knows what she's doing. Um, in prior sessions, she staffed the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor, and she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Clemson University. So uh, hopefully at some point we'll all be together in the building, but um, if you need anything, please reach out uh, to Ms. Thornton. Uh, then we have um, Ashley Kalina. She's the assistant uh, committee policy analyst. Uh, so this is her third session and she earned a master's degree in public policy in 2015 and joined the LCB in 2016. And she previously served in the research divisions constituent services unit. So welcome to the committee. Uh, and then also on camera, we have um, Bradley Wilkinson who is committee counsel with the legal division of LCB. Um, and I should note too, we have a, um, a committee, uh, committee brief that you have or is available online. It has all the contact information for these individuals. So don't feel like you need to write all this down. It has our phone numbers and emails and all that. But I wanna welcome Mr. Wilkinson back. Now this is his 14th legislative session and he has served the last five sessions as committee counsel for the Assembly Committee on Judiciary. And before that, eight sessions as committee counsel for the Senate Committee on Judiciary. So if you're counting, that's 13 sessions on the Judiciary Committee. So basically, he knows everything about everything in the law relating to judiciary. 
Um, he graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, and he earned his law degree from the Seattle University School of Law. So uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, for joining us for another session. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the assembly staff. Uh, the ones I just introduced were our LCB staff. Uh, we have a really large staff on assembly because uh, assembly judiciary because we meet five days a week, uh, which is a lot, it's a lot of work to process. Um, I'm delighted to have um, Bonnie Borda Huffaker back as the committee manager. Um, her office is right uh, sort of adjoined to my office and she is returning as her fourth session as the committee manager. She's a Carson City native and a former employee of the LCB and she is fantastic. She keeps these trains running on time. So um, if you need anything, please feel free to uh, reach out to Bonnie and thank you, Bonnie, for coming back for another session. We then have five committee secretaries. Essentially, we have a committee secretary for each day of the week to manage the volume of work that we do and work on the minutes. So I want to uh, briefly introduce them. Um, Jordan Carlson, uh, this is his first uh, session in the uh, legislature serving in the, uh, with the assembly staff. He's from Yearington and has lived in Nevada most of his life. He graduated from UNR this last semester and is planning on attending graduate school in the fall. So uh, thank you, Mr. Carlson, for joining us this session. Uh, then we have Tracy Dory. She, uh, this is her second session. She is also native Nevadan, born in Elko. She worked for the state of Nevada for 30 years, 14 of them with the Nevada's Office of the Attorney General, who we're gonna hear from in a little bit, and 16 years with the Department of Corrections, who we're also gonna hear from in a little bit, until she retired in 2017. Uh, Miss Dory enjoys traveling, gardening, and raising chickens in her retirement. So thank you for coming back for another session, Miss Dory. Then we have Kaylin Inkstadt. This is Miss Inkstadt's first session. She earned a degree in environmental science from UNR and is seasonally employed in the fields of botany, hydrology, and soil ecology, all things I don't know much about. Uh, she enjoys hiking, sewing, making candles and soap, and spending lots of time with her family and puppy. So thank you for joining us in this most unusual session, Miss Ingstad. Uh, Karen Warner is returning for her seventh session working uh, for this committee. She has a degree in psychology from UNR, and she's married and lives in Dayton. So Miss Warner, I want to thank you for coming back for yet another session. I just can't tell the committee how lucky we are to have so many returning members with us this time. And then we have Linda Wimple, who's also a committee secretary. She grew up in North Lake Tahoe and the Carson City area. She's the proud mother of four children and three grandchildren, and she runs her own marketing business in her spare time. And I'm not sure how many sessions this is, but she's been with us for quite a while. So thank you again, uh, Ms. Wimple, for joining us for another session. So that is our, um, our committee staff. And again, I just want to remind everyone to treat them with respect because without them, we just would not be able to do uh, this really, really important work. So with that being said, um, if you're following along on the agenda, I'm now going to, one moment, trying to navigate this virtual world as well. So many communications coming in different forms. But um, one of the things we have to do as a committee is we have to adopt um, committee policies. So uh, you should have had on Nellis, and I believe it was sent to all of you by email uh, last evening by Ms. Thornton, the proposed Assembly Judiciary Committee policies. And you'll note that we have two different sets of policies. One of them is for virtual meetings, which we're obviously doing now. Um, and the other one is for in-person committee meetings, which we hope to be able to do before the end of session. Now, I'm not gonna go over these in their entirety, but I did just wanna highlight a couple of things that I think we've all done a really good job on. Uh, for the virtual committee meetings, um, we just asked members to make sure you've got your camera on, unless you need to step away for something that's non-legislative related. And we're going to have to take uh, vo uh, roll call voice votes when we have to vote on something. You know, in a committee room, it's a little easier for our committee secretaries to see how you're voting. But when we have to vote on something, we'll actually call the roll. And we ask you just to say yes or no when your name is called for sake of clarity. If you say yay or nay, sometimes it can be confusing. Um, and then, you know, essentially the other one for virtual, as you all know, is just to keep your, your microphones muted. And for both sets of policies, you know, 
really try to limit the work that you're doing to the legislative work that's in front of you. I know we live in a very distracting world with lots of stuff going on all the time, but uh, the more attention you can pay to the committee, uh, the better off we're all going to be. Um, in terms of the in-person, um, the in-person meetings, they're you know pretty much the same, except we'll be meeting um, in person. And um, one rule that I think is important, and this is mentioned in our joint, uh, this is our assembly standing rules, and that's when we get to the point where we are hearing bills and we're deciding on whether to vote those bills out of committee. Um, I'm going to assume that however you vote in committee is how you're going to vote on the floor unless you tell me otherwise. Now, any member is entitled to change their vote between the time we vote in committee and the time we get to the floor, but please just let me know that so there are no surprises. It does happen on occasion, but if you vote yes on something, I'm going to assume you're a yes on the floor unless you tell me otherwise. So, you know, it's just a matter of courtesy and respect if you would let me know so I know where where the votes are. Um, on these particular um, issues. And then, you know, lastly, I know uh, many of you are new to the legislature and new to the committee. Please feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, we do have a process that is pretty formal in committee. Uh, just because we're on Zoom and virtual doesn't mean we lose that respect for the institution. So for instance, um, please don't refer to folks by first name if you're referring to members or presenters. We only go with last names. So Mr. or Mrs. Assemblyman, uh, just try to keep that decorum going. And so, that's probably all I'm going to say on these Assembly Judiciary Committee policies. Um, I do, before I take a motion to adopt them, I did want to ask if any of the members have any questions about the uh, committee policies. And you're probably wondering how you might go about asking a question in this virtual world. A couple different ways you can do that. You can note in the chat that you have a question, or you can simply unmute and indicate that you have a question, and I will uh, try to to get to you. So let me ask uh, before I take any motions, any questions from members on the proposed committee policies? Okay, I don't see any questions. So um, at this point, uh, I would take there's a one, motion. There's one oh. question. It looks like Assemblyman Wheeler is waving. Okay, I'm sorry, Assemblyman Wheeler, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. I'm clicking the button, so I just, and it didn't work, so I just waved my hand. But um, just wanted to, uh, not really a question, but uh, say that my belief is that we should be allowed to meet in person if we so choose. Um, and I wanted to put that on the record. I understand a lot of people would not choose to do that. And that's fine uh, for safety's sake. But if we so choose, it's my belief that we should be able to meet in person, keep our social distancing. I think there's ways to do it. So I just wanted to put that on the record and thank you for letting me speak, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman Wheeler. And I, I certainly hope um, we can be meeting in person before the end of this session sooner rather than later. But I, I appreciate those comments. Um, any other uh, questions on the committee policies? I think I've got you all on my screen now, so I don't see anybody. Um, so at this time, I would take a motion to approve both the virtual and in-person committee meetings, committee policy. Uh, looks like I have a, I have a couple of hands. I see Assemblywoman Krasner has her I'll hand make up. a motion. Assemblywoman Krasner is going to make a motion. Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that, Assemblywoman. I have a Owen. second from Vice Chair Wynn. So now I'm going to ask um, our committee secretary to please go ahead and do a roll call vote on this motion. Uh, Assemblywoman Bilbrey Axelrod. Uh, Assemblywoman Cohen? Yes. I apologize, yes. Uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes. Assemblywoman Hansen? Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy? Yes. Assemblywoman Kasama? Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner? Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola? Yes. Assemblyman Miller? Yes. Assemblywoman Wen? Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill?
Assemblyman O'Neill. Yes. Assemblyman Orant Liquor. Yes. Assemblywoman Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Okay, one more time. Yeah. Assemblyman Wheeler. No. And Chair Yeager. Yes. And I do think, uh, I'm not sure of the precise vote count, but I know we, I know it passed based on the numbers. I think Assemblyman Wheeler was the only no. Uh, before I, thank you committee, and before I move on to the next item, um, I do note we had our two other members um, join us. So I want to give them a chance. I know um, Assemblywoman Krasner and Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Um, I just gave uh, other members a chance to briefly um, state their name, their district, where their district is, and why they wanted to be on the Judiciary Committee. So um, Assemblywoman Krasner, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to you just to give a brief introduction of yourself to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair Yeager. Hello, everyone. My name is Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner, and I represent Nevada State Assembly District 26, which encompasses Incline Village, South Reno, um, and that's about it. So I'm, I'm definitely from the north. Um, I'm very proud to be here and to uh, represent the people of Nevada in their government. Uh, this is my third regular session. I also did two special sessions in the Nevada legislature. Uh, I've served on the Judiciary Committee all three sessions, uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be back. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Welcome back to the committee. Um, I know we have Assemblywoman um, Summers Armstrong, who I think was having some technical difficulties. So she may be on somebody else's computer. And what would the first day of Zoom meetings in committee be without some technical difficulties? So we certainly understand that, um, Assemblywoman, but wanted to give you a chance to briefly introduce yourself. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. This is Chandra Summers Armstrong. I am the Assemblywoman for Assembly District 6 in Southern Nevada. Uh, our district encompasses from the south, Bonanza Road, uh, north to Cheyenne, east to just a little bit past Las Vegas Boulevard, and then to the west, Decatur. Um, this is my first term. I'm really excited to be on this committee. Um, I wanted to be on this committee. Um, I started actually my career um, as a legal secretary, so I've always had um, interest in the law. Um, married to an attorney, worked uh, in the courthouse as a judicial assistant for several years, um, but also have been engaged in um, some activism around criminal justice in my community for uh, quite a few years. And so this is really an honor to be here, um, to be able to see uh, how the quote sausage is made um, to get better understanding and hopefully to participate in the uh, drafting and implementing hopefully of legislation that benefits um, all communities in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman, and welcome to the committee. Uh, before I go to the next um, agenda item, you know, I neglected to do something because we're in the virtual world and um, I'm used to being in a committee room and seeing members of the public in person. Um, I know there are a lot of folks tuning in um, on the legislature's website or on the YouTube channel, members of the public. And so I wanted to welcome you to the committee as well. Uh, we're sad that you're not here with us in the building and we hope uh, certainly that we can have you here very soon. But we did want to acknowledge uh, that you're watching and we appreciate you taking an interest in the work of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to turn the presentation over to our very able policy analyst, uh, Ms. Diane Thornton, to go over our committee brief. Uh, I've gone over part of it with you in terms of the members and the staff, but she's going to go over just the rest of it so you get a little bit of a feel of, of what kind of topics and what kind of workload we're going to have here in the Assembly Judiciary Committee. So uh, when you're ready, Ms. Thornton, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Diane Thornton, and I'll be your committee policy analyst for this session. It's really good to see returning members, and I look forward to working with the new legislators. Uh, as the chair mentioned, the contact information is in the front of the policy brief, and we're here to help. So if you have any questions 
um, please just give us a call. As the community policy analyst, I'm here to help us process all the information, the bills, the amendments, the work session that goes through this committee. So any questions, please call me. Um, with that said, I'm here to present the committee brief and the brief is just kind of a broad overview of what you can expect from the committee this session. Um, there's a little bit of background information as far as the committee jurisdiction. Um, it's kind of broad. It's we have everything from uh, criminal penalties to domestic violence, um, business associations, cannabis, wills and estates. And like the chair said, because of that, we tend to be the heaviest policy committee in the legislature. Uh, just for your information, there is a list of publications and resources within all your free time that you can read. Uh, there is a little bit of um, information on the criminal justice reform that we passed in the 2019 session, along with some overviews of juvenile justice and some other things like that. Another really important aspect of the brief is um, a list of the interim studies. And because so much policy work gets done during the interim um, and a lot of the bills that we'll see that come before the committee come from these interim studies. So if you're ever looking for background information on a bill that came from a study, there's a list there that you can go reference. Uh, lastly in the brief is just kind of a brief overview of the court structure of the state of Nevada and also the convictions and punishments and it goes over felonies and gross misdemeanors. And uh, thank you, Chair. That's all I have for you. Looking forward to this session. Thank you so much, Ms. Thornton. And again, uh, committee, we're lucky to have staff that have so many sessions um, under their belts uh, joining us again this session. So if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to them if you can't get myself or Vice Chair Wynn. Okay, so with all that behind us, um, if you're following along on the agenda, we have two presentations today. Uh, we first have a presentation from the Office of the Attorney General and then a presentation from the Department of Corrections. Uh, now, some of you returning members may ask, why, why do we do these presentations? We already know these things. Um, things can change quite a bit in a year and a half, two years. So I think it's always good to get a refresher uh, from the folks who are out there doing the day-to-day -day work. Um, I have asked our presenters to try to keep their remarks fairly brief because I wanna have a chance for committee members to ask questions. I think that's really important. Um, rather than just being lectured to. So um, as they present, feel free to jot down questions that you might have and just, you know, when we get to the end, I'll take questions from members for the presenters. So at this time, I wanna hand it over to uh, the Office of the Attorney General. I know Attorney General Ford is on the call and I think uh, some members of his team um, are with him as well. So um, Attorney General Ford, uh, I wanna welcome you and your staff and please uh, go ahead and present when you are ready. Very well, good morning, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. I'm hoping that you can hear me okay. Um, I have my mask on, our people are socially distanced, uh, and uh, I'm going to remove it briefly to go my presentation, and then I present myself to you, Chair, and uh, members of the committee for uh, any questions. So uh, good morning again, uh, members of the committee. My name is Aaron Ford and I am your Attorney General. I thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of the Office of Attorney General. Our office consists of nearly 400 dedicated and hardworking individuals committed to enforcing Nevada law and upholding justice for the, production, for the protection and benefit of all of our citizens, as well as our residents. As the state's Chief Law Enforcement Officer, the Attorney General represents the people of Nevada before the state and federal trial and appellate courts in criminal and civil matters. We serve as legal counsel to state offices, officers, uh, to state departments, most state boards and commissions. And we work with our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners to protect the public. In addition to my written testimony, which I have submitted to you, I have provided committee staff with an agency organizational chart and a copy of the agency's biannual report, uh, which was submitted to the governor's office and released publicly on September the 1st, 2020. While that report goes into significantly greater detail, I'd like to highlight a few key accomplishments 
of the Office of Attorney General over the last two years of my administration. Before I proceed further, I want to introduce those who are with me uh, here in Carson City. Uh, to my left, probably your right, is my Chief of Staff, Jessica Adair. Uh, to my right uh, is my second assistant, uh, Christine Jones-Brady, who oversees our criminal division, our um, uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, as well as working with our post-conviction uh, unit. Uh, on the screen elsewhere, um, I believe, is my first assistant, Kyle George, who oversees the civil components of my office, uh, and as well as my Solicitor General, Heidi Perry Stern. Um, and to the extent there are questions that relate to their particular work, uh, I am going to uh, defer uh, the mic to them and allow them to answer those questions as well. Uh, but back to some of the accomplishments of this administration. We responded to a global pandemic to minimize the loss of life in Nevada, assisting state agencies and thousands of Nevadans who called our office seeking help. It saved over 1.2 billion, with a B, taxpayer dollars by vigorously defending the state and providing quality client advice. We secured tens of millions, with an M, of dollars in settlement funding and federal grants. We've investigated and prosecuted and defended appeals against those who seek to harm Nevadans, including murderers, abusers, and scammers. We provided robust constituent services to Nevadans seeking assistance, receiving 50,585 written inquiries, 50, five zero, and we sponsored laws to protect Nevadans. During the last legislative session, 14 bills sponsored by my office were signed into law. All 14 bills received strong bipartisan support. I look forward to working with you again this year to pass 15 bills uh, to improve the lives of Nevada families, hopefully again with broad bipartisan support. Every attorney general brings their own per perspective as to how to protect and improve the lives of Nevada. The overarching theme that I've used to set the intention of our work here in this office is a hashtag that I introduced on day two on the job. The hashtag being our job is justice. To guide my decision making, I framed in my administration by a set of policy priorities. These priorities do not override our statutory obligations, but rather they serve as a lens through which we view our work. I refer to these priorities, and I would venture to bet that you could ask anyone in this office of these priorities, and they can recite them to you as the five C's, constitutional rights, criminal justice and reform, consumer protection, client service, and community engagement. Each of these C's, C's serve as a moral compass to guide the way our office operates and the way that we serve Nevadans. Our office is composed of several divisions with specific assignments related to the Attorney General's statutory responsibilities and the administration of this office. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about those. As regards to serving justice for Nevadans, several divisions are dedicated to one of the most sacred responsibilities of this office, again, seeking justice for victims of crime and protecting vulnerable Nevadans. Our criminal prosecution division, which is uh, helmed by our chief, Michael Kovac, prosecutes financial fraud, including scam, insurance fraud, workers' compensation fraud, securities fraud, mortgage fraud. They also, uh, they also prosecute sex trafficking, cyber crimes, public integrity cases, and crimes that occur in the Nevada Department of corrections facilities. In the past two years, this division has charged several murder cases, including the 1979 murder of a Reno woman in a case that had gone cold, elder abuse murders, and killings in Nevada prisons. We've prosecuted hundreds of cases from child sex trafficking to scams and fraud to animal abuse. In the state fiscal years 2019 and 2020, the workers' compensation and insurance fraud units filled filed 389 prosecutions and had nearly $1.5 million in restitution and costs awarded to the state. Let me discuss quickly uh, our post-conviction division, which is helmed by Chief Heather Proctor. Uh, that division handles petitions for habeas corpus in state and federal courts. The division is also responsible for representing the state in death penalty appeals. In the past biennium, the, the division handled 11,000 666 federal habeas cases and 5,797 state habeas cases. 
This division is also responsible for implementing a new law passed by this body, last legislative session, that, that uh, works to compensate those Nevadans who were wrongly convicted of crimes they did not commit. Uh, I uh, gave this task to them, and they have uh, done an exceptional job of ensuring that individuals who have been wrongly convicted have received uh, their just compensation. Uh, let me turn quickly to our Medicaid Fraud Control Division, which is helmed by Chief Andrew Schultz. Uh, this division investigates and prosecutes fraud by healthcare providers in the Nevada Medical Program, Medicaid Program. Uh, for the past biennium, the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit opened 80 investigations, closed 67 investigations, and has successfully prosecuted 34 criminal cases involving fraudulent activities by companies scamming the Medicaid system. In the process, the division recovered $13,510, pardon me, $13,510,403 for state fiscal years 2019 and 2020. Uh, this unit also reports, reviews reports of abuse of, or criminal neglect of patients and facilities that use Medicaid. And the unit focused on community engagement as well, partnering with medical schools to train students on how to identify signs of elder abuse and neglect. Turning to another important component of my office, the Protection Division, uh, which is helmed by our chief, Ernest Figueroa, uh, that division diligently works to protect Nevada consumers and econ uh, from economic harm. The division has four primary areas of focus. The first is advocacy for rate payers before the Public Utilities Commission and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to ensure rate payers receive reliable utility service at a reasonable cost. The second is to protect consumers through enforcement of the Nevada Deceptive Trade Practices Act. They also work in their third area to prevent uh, unfair markets through enforcement of the Unfair Trade Practices Act and federal antitrust law. And fourthly, they work on the administration of the Home Again Nevada Homeowner Relief Program. The past two years, this division is responsible for bringing tens of millions of dollars to the state as a result of settlements, which companies that violated Nevada's consumer rights, such as consumer data breaches. Of note, we negotiated a settlement with the T-Mobile merger to guarantee that every T-Mobile job in Nevada will stay in Nevada and employee bargaining rights will be protected. Additionally, T-Mobile will offer a low-cost plan for Nevada consumers and build out coverage for rural internet service. The team is also responsible for responding to thousands of COVID-19-related complaints, uh, which became quite prevalent, as you might imagine, over the last year. These complaints related to, for example, price gouging, failure to issue refunds, illegal evictions, and scams. The Bureau of Consumer Protection also represented ratepayers before the Public Utilities Commission, saving them from increased utilities, uh, utility costs, especially due to the financial impact of the pandemic. Let me move to the next division, the Investigative Division, helmed by uh, Chief William Scott, a former almost 30-year veteran of the Metropolitan Police Department in Clark County. The Office of Attorney General Investigators worked diligently with our prosecutors and local federal law enforcement partners to investigate a wide variety, a wide array of criminal activity. Since 2019, that division has received over 8,000 complaints, completed over 1,000 investigations, and referred over 530 cases for prosecution, arrested 246 suspects, and recovered 81 missing children. Additionally, the office provides vital support to Nevada um, through our multi-jurisdictional task forces, such as the IRS Financial Fraud Task Force, the Child Exploitation Task Force, the Healthcare Fraud Task Force, relative to opioid-related matters, the Southern Nevada Human Trafficking Task Force, the Elder and Vulnerable Person Investig Investigation Task Force, and the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. The Investigations Division is also focused on engaging with the local community to better foster relationships and trust with the people we serve. Let me discuss quickly uh, the domestic office of uh, the domestic violence um, um, ombudsman. I always have a hard time saying that word. Uh, helmed by Nicole Riley. That office, um, we hold the unacceptable distinction of being one of the worst states for domestic violence. The domestic violence ombudsman serves as a liaison to all state and local partners on issues related to domestic violence, 
sexual assault and human trafficking. The Ombudsman serves as a state level coordinator with oversight of many programs and initiatives, including the statewide Committee on Domestic Violence and Nevada Vine. Is a statewide auto, uh, in Nevada Vine, which is a statewide automatic system that allows victims to receive timely, accurate information on the custody status of offenders. One of the programs that was developed by my predecessor that I continued was one that relates to uh, assisting our military community, and that is the Office of Military Legal Assistance, helmed by Special Assistant Attorney General Nick Dana. That office provides pro bono legal advice for veterans and military families in civil matters and is the first of its kind in the Attorney General Office across our nation. This program's launched in November 2015, and with the assistance of our pro bono legal aid partners, the Office of Military Legal Assistance has helped over 3,650 service members in veterans. Even during the pandemic, the Office of Military Legal Assistance continued operating virtually, particularly assisting military families facing eviction. Let me turn to another important component of our, of our office, which is representing our state. Our office represents all constitutional offices and state executive branch agencies, as well as many statutory boards and commissions. The attorneys within this division have a broad range of expertise, including in fields uh, such as local taxation, business law, regulatory law, election law, employment law, constitutional law, and civil litigation. It is in these divisions that my priority of client service is paramount. Both staff often find ways to incorporate other priorities, such as the protection of constitutional rights. In this arena, we talk about our gaming division. Our chief is Darlene Caruso, and she advises, they advise the Nevada Gaming Commission and the State Gaming Control Board. They also advise the Nevada State Athletic Commission and the Nevada Gaming Policy Committee. In addition to daily legal advice, Staff also represent the board and commission at monthly public meetings. Litigation in this division includes disciplinary actions brought against gaming licensees, disputes regarding taxes and fees, hearings on the surrender of gaming licenses, and actions to add to the list of excluded persons. We also have a division that focuses on boards and open government. That's helmed by our chief, Rosalie Bordela. The board and open government division provides counsel to all NRS Title 54 Occupational Licensing Board on Administrative Law and Procedure, Administrative Rulemaking, the Law of Licensure, and the Open Meetings Law. Deputies in this division attend meetings of the boards and commissions, as well as serve as prosecutor and board counsel in disciplinary proceedings against licensees. Staff are also responsible for enforcing the Open Meetings Law for all public bodies. Turning now to the Government and Natural Resources Division, which is helmed by our Chief Greg Ott. That division serves client agencies and officials responsible for providing core governmental infrastructure, such as the Controller, the Department of Administration, the Nevada Indian Commission, and the Public Employees Retirement System. The division also serves agencies responsible for managing and protecting the state's natural resources and environment, such as the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Division of Environmental Protection, the Department of Water Resources, the Department of Nuclear Projects, and others. Attorneys in this division helped to come up with the settlement with the U.S. Department of Energy to remove the plutonium that was shipped to our state without its consent. Let me turn now to discuss the division helmed by Chief Julie Slaybaugh, which is the Health and Human Services Division. That division serves as counsel to the Department of Health and Human Services in its many divisions. Our office advises DHHS on some of the most critical matters to Nevada, which includes service to the divisions of health care, finance, and policy, Medicaid, for example, uh, welfare and supportive services, health, mental health, and developmental services, aging services, and the division of child and family services as well. As you can imagine, this team has been absolutely critical to the state's COVID-19 response. Chief Cameron Vandenberg helms our, our personnel division, which as you might imagine, advises executive branch departments, divisions and agencies on employment law, including administrative hearings regarding discipline of state employees, judicial review of administrative uh, proceedings, resolution of grievances before the Employment Management Committee, and litigation in state and federal courts regarding the employment relationship. 
Our public safety division is helmed by Chief Randy Gilmer, and that uh, division advises the Nevada Department of Corrections. I hear, you're going to be hearing from them later on today. Uh, and uh, Chief Gilmer and his division also provide representation in all inmate-related litigation, including property and constitutional rights. Staff in this division also participate in the Inmate Mediation Program, which is a unique program of alternative dispute resolution for inmates. Chief Dennis Gallagher helms our tra transportation division. That division advises the transportation uh, board of directors and the many divisions of the Nevada Department of Transportation. Staff in this division provides counsel on many complex transportation matters uh, and also represent the Department of Public Safety in its many divisions, including parole and probation, as well as the Department of Motor Vehicles. Our business and taxation division uh, is run, is overseen by Chief David Pope. That division provides daily legal advice to the Department of Taxation and the Department of Business and Industry and its 11, 11 divisions, including the Division of Real Estate, Mortgage Lending, Insurance, Financial Institutions, the Taxi Cab Authority, Transportation Services Authority, the Labor Commission, Consumer Affairs, Housing, Industrial Relations, and OSHA. Attorneys in this division also enforce the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement and its compliance program to prevent underage smoking. Staff also represents the newly created Cannabis Compliance Board and prosecutes violations of cannabis licensee. I've mentioned my Solicitor General, uh, Heidi Perry Stern. She runs our Solicitor General's office as well as oversees our complex, complex litigation division. Uh, she oversees all appeals before the Nevada Court of Appeals, the Nevada Supreme Court, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It also houses, as I've indicated, the Complex Litigation Division, a team of highly specialized and experienced attorneys who work with staff in all divisions on complex matters or cases that expose the state to great financial liability. Let me turn to the administration, uh, the administrative division. We are uh, our office is more than just one of the largest law firms in the state. It represents a constitutional office elected by the people of Nevada to serve our state. Our office has a lean yet efficient staff who support the daily functioning of a large agency. The, administ the administrative division includes IT personnel, human resources staff, uh, human resources staff, office managers, and legal secretaries dedicated to each legal division. Again, this division is helmed by my um, Chief of Staff, Jessica Adair. The communications team manages a robust public outreach program to help Nevadans uh, protect themselves from crime and respond to media inquiries. The constituent services unit is responsible for attending to all complaints, concerns, and questions sent to the Office of Attorney General. PSU staff, I just want to note this year, processed over 18,000 emails and complaints in 2019 and over 32,000 emails and complaints in 2020. That does not include phone calls and walk-ins to the office. And that is, that is, that is office is comprised of three, four, five people, five people. Uh, and thank you to the legislature for the last four rounds for, to give us a, uh, for giving us a handful of additional folks to help with that. It's been extremely busy there, as you might imagine, during COVID. The administration division also houses the chief financial officer who oversees uh, fiscal analysts, tort claims administration, and the Grants Unit. The Grants Unit is currently administering 17 grants uh, for a total of nearly $16 million. The Grants Unit manages several federal programs focusing on supporting victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, elder exploitation, and gang suppression. The Grants Unit has developed close relationships with local, state, and federal agencies, victim service providers, and others who administer grants across the state. My final topic is our future focus. Looking forward, it is clear that we as elected officials have a lot of work to do to build trust. Our nation and our state are divided and trust in our government is broken. Many of our neighbors trust that, and trust what they read on the internet more than they trust the people that live in our communities and the people elected to represent them. As I often, often stated, as representatives of the government, there are three types of communities in which we must work to build trust. We must augment trust in those communities who have always believed in government. We must restore trust in communities who have historically trusted the government 
but whose trust has diminished for some reason. And we must create trust in communities that have never had trust in government in the first place. In the next two years of my term as Attorney General, my special focus is to restore, augment, and create trust in this agency and the state. We will do so by continuing our job of justice to do the best of our, in, our, in, our, in our ability every day, providing the best plan services, being transparent about our agency, following through on our commitments, always making decisions based on what the best interest of Nevada is. And when Nevadans are in need, we will continue to answer the call. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with each of you throughout the legislative session. With that, Chair Yeager, I turn the mic back to you for any questions that may uh, be present. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Attorney General. And, you know, I wanted to note for the members, I don't know uh, how you're viewing your screen, but, um, you know, if you look at the different tiles, you will see that um, Mr. George from the Attorney General's office is on Zoom as well. Uh, maybe you could just wave to everyone if you don't mind, Mr. George. Um, and I want to I want to just uh, make sure that you have that introduction, because if any of you are working on criminal justice related bills, uh, I think you'd be wise to reach out to the Attorney General's office. Um, we had a lot of legislation last session where uh, we worked very intimately uh, with Mr. George and Ms. Adair, uh, Ms. Jones Brady, and, and Attorney General Ford himself. So I want to make sure that um, you all know who these people are. Um, we have uh, their contact information. We can get to you if you need it. But I think you would you would be wise to keep that in mind if you're working on these policies. I've always uh, found their office to be a very willing partner in helping uh, with some of these issues, particularly for um, how they're going to work in the real world. And you know, with that being said, I, I do want to highlight um, the bill that uh, General Ford mentioned. And I know those of you who were here last year, I think uh, fortunately it passed unanimously and that was the bill to give compensation to those who were wrongfully convicted and incarcerated here in our state. Uh, their office was instrumental in helping with that. And I can tell you they've done a, just a fantastic job working through that litigation because the way we set that law up you know, the, the wrongfully convicted person actually sues the state of Nevada. So the attorney general is is the council of records. So they're the ones responsible for processing those cases. And they've done just a fantastic job over the last year and a half of making that happen. Uh, just by way of preview, I'll let the committee know we are going to uh, deal with some legislation, making some, I would consider, small changes to that law to make it work a little better in real life. So, you know, I'm sure we'll have the attorney general uh, on for that to talk about some of the rationale behind it. Uh, bill has not yet been drafted. It's being worked on. So we'll see it sometime in the future. So I did want to take an opportunity to thank you and your office for working on that legislation, as well as the 13 or 14 other bills you had mentioned. Um, before I turn it over to um, questions from the committee, I just had uh, one question, General Ford, that I think would be good for the committee to hear, because uh, I know it's an issue that's been going on in our state for a long time, and it certainly predates um, your administration, and that is the backlog of sexual assault kits um, that um, were, I mean, I think four or five, six years ago, we learned about this backlog, and I think all of us involved in this process were quite stunned by how many kits were out there that had not been tested. So I wondered if you could just give us an update on uh, what your office um, has been doing on that front, uh, whether there are any kits left to be tested, and perhaps more importantly, whether the testing of those kits actually resulted in prosecution and conviction of uh, sexual offenders. Uh, thank you so much, Chair uh, Yeager, for the question. You will recall uh, during our concurrent tenure in the legislative building, uh, you and I both worked to ensure from a legislative perspective that we could provide this office um, additional resources to assist in clearing of the sexual assault kit back law. I am happy to say that the update is that uh, Chair Yeager and members of the committee um, is that that backlog is non-existent at this point. Uh, we have in fact in Southern Nevada, uh, I wanna say late last year, I cleared that backlog and then uh, about a month or so ago in Northern Nevada, we heard that we also cleared that backlog. There have been a handful of prosecutions already take place. Um, and you know, I am I am very pleased with that work. This is uh, something that my public information officer, Monica Moaz, has worked on intimately with the last administration and with this administration. And her phraseology, I think, describes it best. It was a continuity of purpose. 
that allowed us to continue that uh, between administrations and to come to this conclusion. I also want to offer uh, uh, some congratulations to my chief of staff, Jessica Adair, who's likewise worked intimately on this issue. And if you will indulge us, allow her a few words in response to that question as well. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, I am likewise pleased to report um, on the status of the arrangement backlog. Uh, we actually should have received just yesterday, I believe, our most recent biennial report uh, regarding the status of all the kids being tested, as well as the number of requests and COVID kits that have resulted in the work project. Um, I would like to just take a quick second to brag on our grants team. The state of Nevada is the only state in the country to receive six consecutive SAWKEY grants. Thanks to that grant funding, um, appropriations from the legislature at, a couple by any ago, and settlement funding from the previous Attorney General's administration, we have completely uh, tested every single SAC kit. The work is not over. Now that the kits are tested, we move to a new phase, and that's investigation and prosecution. And many of those kids that have already been tested have uh, already uh, proceeded in investigation and have proceeded with some prosecutions, but there were over 11,000 facts that were untested. So as you can imagine, should those victims choose to move forward with investigation and prosecution, as a state, we have a lot of work to do. We look forward to continuing to work with you um, as we move forward with those new stages of the project and continuing to uh, better protect victims of sexual assault and provide the resources that they need um, if and when that, that ever happens to them. So thank you so much for your continued work on this issue. Thank you for that response. And that is indeed uh, fantastic news. Uh, we have come a very long way from where we were uh, five or six years ago. So uh, certainly your office is to be commended as is the prior administration for starting, uh, starting us down this path. Um, I did want to note for the committee, I forgot to mention this, for the committee members and for members of the public who are watching, uh, if you access Nellis, there are exhibits that you can access there, including uh, General Ford's remarks uh, that he gave. So if you're like me and you're uh, more of a visual person than, a, than an audio person, you can go back and review his remarks. Um, and then there's also an uh, organizational chart from the Nevada Attorney General, as well as the biennial report that was referenced. So that is available on Nellis uh, for you to review at your leisure, or if you know three months into session, you say, oh, I can't remember uh, who's at head, head of this division, you can go back and look at that. Those, uh, those documents will be on Nellis uh, in perpetuity. So if you haven't accessed that yet, please feel free uh, to do that if you need any additional information. So uh, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna see if um, any other committee members have any questions that they would like to ask General Ford or his team here today. I think I have all of you on my screen. So you could raise your hand, you can send me a chat, you can unmute. Are there questions out there? I see one from Assemblywoman Krasner. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Yeager. I just want to say thank you so much to Attorney General Ford and everyone at the Attorney General's office, Ms. Adair, Mr. George, uh, for making this happen. The rate kit backlog uh, is something that I've been concerned about for many years, and I am so happy that here in the state of Nevada, uh, we really care about our victims and our victims' rights. So thank you, Attorney General Ford and the entire office. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Um, other questions? You're also small, it's like Hollywood Squares. So any, any hands up there for questions? I don't see any at the moment. So I think uh, General Ford, that's probably a testament to the uh, thoroughness of your presentation. Um, and so I, I wanna thank you for presenting to us. And uh, so look at the chat, make sure there weren't questions. I wanna thank you and your team for being here to present to us. Obviously we wish that uh, we were all in a room together and we could talk and hopefully we'll be able to do that very soon. But. Uh, we look forward as a committee to working with you. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a number of bills in front of the committee uh, that we'll look forward to hearing and processing. But again, I want to 
uh, encourage members to reach out. If you uh, review attorney general bills, you have questions or concerns, reach out to them. And likewise, uh, General Ford, you and your uh, staff know that uh, we're always available to assist in what I believe is a common mission uh, in making sure that we have an effective criminal justice system here in the state of Nevada. Well, thank you, Chair Yeager. Uh, thank you, by the way, Simon McCrath, for uh, the compliment. We appreciate that. Uh, and congratulations to all of you for uh, either being reelected or elected for the first time. Uh, I watched um, and got goosebumps as you all were being sworn in, and I look forward to working with you all. Uh, I wish you Godspeed, um, and I wish you the stamina that you will need in order to continue leading this state in the right direction. So thank you so much, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day. Okay, committee, so we are gonna move on to, um, I guess the second to last uh, agenda item, and that is a presentation from the Nevada Department of Corrections. Um, as you might imagine, when we review criminal justice policies, crimes and punishment, uh, Nevada Department of Corrections is a constant figure in those discussions. Uh, because they're the ones who are housing offenders and trying to get them ready to be released back into the community. So we're fortunate to have uh, a number of individuals with us today from the Department of Corrections. And uh, I won't introduce them all, but I did want to welcome uh, the director of the Nevada Department of Corrections, uh, Director Charles Daniels, to the meeting. I think uh, he is on here. And sir, we appreciate you being here this morning. Um, and when you're ready, please go ahead and give your presentation, and then I'm sure we'll have some questions for you. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Charles Daniels, Director, Nevada Department of Corrections. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you a brief snapshot about our agency to include where we are and our vision moving forward. Next slide, please. Is it up? Oh, okay. Oh, so let me let me interrupt you just really quickly, Director Daniels, to make sure um, everybody's on the same page. So I wanna let committee members know there is a presentation from the Nevada Department of Corrections that you can find on Nellis. Um, so it's simply titled Presentation from the Department of Corrections. It looks like it's about 13 slides. So you wanna follow along uh, with that during the presentation for committee members and members of the public. I think that'll help guide our discussion today. So I apologize for the interruption, Director Daniels. Please continue. Well, thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Assemblyman Wheeler. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I just want to let everybody know also that it's on the call here. You can hit the share screen button uh, at the lower part of your screen and the presentation will come up as well. I'm learning this technical stuff. Well, let me ask, I don't know, um, for the Department of Corrections, do you guys have the ability? Do you have the presentation that you can share? Can you share the screen? Okay. Yes, so, uh, Chair, this is Director Daniels, and yes, we do have a copy. How would you like me to proceed? Oh, that's a good question. Hello, this is America in broadcast. If you guys are able to pull the presentation up and then put it into a full screen, we'll be able to go and put it out to broadcast. Yeah, and that and that's okay. I mean, we're 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 working through with all these technical difficulties. So I just ask members and, and members of the public if you could simply access it on Nellis and follow along, and and we'll get uh, we'll get issues ironed out for future meetings. But uh, so please just go ahead and, and proceed, Director Daniels. I don't want to hold this up from valuable information. Well, the record. Thank you, uh, Chair Yeager. So let me introduce you to our executive team. They are very talented, dedicated, and deeply committed to not only leading their respective division and or section, but are committed to making deliberate and meaningful change related to criminal justice reform and racial injustice. Further, we seek to enhance, create, and develop reentry efforts with the goal of providing the offender with skills, education, and temperament to leave our custody with a high probability of being successful and never returning uh, to custody. Additionally, NDOC, uh, in, I'm sorry, NDOC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been ex extraordinary. 
All 2,700 employees have been designated as essential, which required them to report to duty, regardless of position, despite dealing with child care issues, illness, family caretaking responsibilities, and unemployment of family members and significant others. Our staff also had to deal with significant staffing shortages to compensate for vacancies due to illness, isolation, and quarantine. I am proud of the work, uh, the work ethic of NDOC staff with a special nod to our healthcare professionals and field generals who are our wardens and their teams. Uh, next slide, if you're turning on the slides. So, following our seven points uh, of focus representing a current snapshot of our operations and a roadmap. If you can't see it, I have basically eight items listed and I'm just going to tell you about them briefly and you're going to be, uh, this is the precursor to the screens to follow as we hit each one in some detail. We're going to be talking about our demographic information, our COVID-19 response, also hepatitis C, staffing challenges, strategic planning, programs, and uh, items in general that don't fall under those. So we're now we'll be transitioning to the next screen if you're following along on the screen. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of information just for perspective about our demographics. As it relates to our inmate population, we have 10,079 males and 954 females. As it relates to staffing, we have 1,687 custody and uh, we have 885 non-custody. We operate 24 seven, seven what we consider to be major institutions, which consist of our maximum security and our medium securities. And then we also have an additional nine camps. And then we have two additional uh, transitional uh, housing. So uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. And at this time, I'm going to turn this over to our medical director, Dr. Michael Manette. Good morning, uh, Chair Yeager, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Michael Manette. I am the medical director for the Nevada Department of Corrections. I'm going to speak to you briefly regarding uh, our COVID-19 mitigation efforts and the continuing treatment of our uh, hepatitis C positive inmates. Uh, so the, the Nevada Department of Corrections Medical Division has remained proactive and flexible during the COVID-19 pandemic through the implementation of agency-specific Centers for Disease Control and Local Health Authority guidelines. The Nevada Department of Corrections has obtained approval to administer the COVID-19 vaccine to staff and inmate at all of our major institutions. Offenders will be vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine according to the to the uh, designated age cohorts created by the Department of Health and Human Services. The Nevada Department of Corrections continues to closely collaborate with the COVID-19 Task Force, the Governor's Finance Office, and the Department of Health and Human Services through regular meetings and updates. With the advent of the COVID-19 vaccine, the Nevada Department of Corrections is currently prioritized, prioritizing vaccination efforts for all eligible staff members as well, we are collecting information on inmates interested in the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, next slide continues with uh, COVID-19. As of uh, January 29, 2021, 874 uh, NDOT staff members have been vaccinated for COVID-19, which is approximately 33% of all NDOC staff members. COVID-19 vaccination uh, consent forms are currently being distributed to all offenders across the state to assess the number of offenders interested in the COVID-19 vaccine. NDOC currently tests both staff and offenders for COVID-19 on a weekly basis. Weekly testing for COVID-19 has not only reduced the frequency of offender outbreaks, it has also facilitated the clearance of staff to return to work in a timely manner. As of January 27, 2021, uh, the Nevada Department of Corrections currently has 61,118 Now rapid COVID-19 tests in, in its possession. The Bionax Now uh, test is a rapid antigen test, which allows a rapid uh, assessment and testing of individuals for COVID-19 within 15 minutes. Next slide is going to be uh, on hepatitis C. 
The Nevada Department of Corrections continues to identify and treat inmates infected with hepatitis C. As of January 28, 2021, our medical providers have identified 745 inmates with active hepatitis C infection. 180 of these inmates are priority level one inmates according to Medical Directive 219. Initially, the Nevada Department of Corrections had forecasted a total of 2,400 hepatitis C positive inmates based on intake data. The Nevada Department of Corrections Medical Department has partnered with Hope's Clinic in Reno to facilitate the treatment of these inmates going forward. I'd like to uh, turn the uh, presentation now back to uh, Director Charles Daniels. Thank you, Dr. Manette. At this point, we're going to transition into staffing challenges, and I will turn this over to our Chief of Human Resources, uh, Ms. Christina Leathers. Good morning, Chair Yeager and Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Christina Leathers, Chief Human Resources Officer. <coughs> Excuse me. NCOC continues to struggle with staffing in rural areas due to lack of housing and urban amenities. As such, NDOC is requesting permission to execute a reclassification of both Ely State Prison and High Days State Prison. Through this effort, it would convert Ely to a medium security facility and High Desert to a maximum medium security facility. This reclassification would allow NDOC uh, um, to prepare for a reduction in unbudgeted overtime, increased programming, um, identify appropriate staffing for this classification of offenders, improve emergency response time, um, offer a reduction in staff fatigue and burnout, as well as um, stakeholder support. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Director Daniels. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. This is Director Daniels for the record. So I'd like to transition into our next screen if you're following me along. And it's basically it's our vision, it's our strategic plan. The very first thing we're going to do with our strategic planning is to try to transition our organization to one that is uh, adheres to industry standards and best practices. And at some point we will seek uh, uh, accreditation through the American Correctional Association, which is considered corrections in the United States and NIC. NIC is the National Institute of Corrections. And they're the ones that are responsible for identifying and disseminating training and information on industry best practices. I've uh, been a member of both these organizations for over 30 years. And we really need to, in my opinion, more ourselves to where they are so we can be prepared to move into the future. Part of that reason is what well, part of the issue is also how we accomplish our jobs, what we do and how we staff. Currently, we have a post-centric uh, uh, staffing model, which is inefficient and cumbersome, and it doesn't utilize staff effectively. So we're going to propose and attempt to try to move on into what we call a task-centric staffing model. And what it does, it maximizes staffing and resources while allowing NDOC to be more effective and efficient in the daily operations of our facilities. It'll also help us identify areas of need by analyzing each institution's data and current assignment of staff. It'll consider four categories and they will consist of what are our daily activities. That's also based on the day of the week and the evening. Incident-driven responses, training and staff development, as well as crime interdiction. We also want to stand up and modernize our emergency preparedness and special operations program. Uh, and we want to identify standard operating procedures that can be employed in establishing command in a correctional setting and provide a system of effective management of personnel and resources that, uh, that we utilize to respond to an incident. We would also want to ensure we are able to have our staff evolve uh, in our, and implement and employ development strategy to facilitate more training opportunities by utilizing senior correctional officers and skilled training officers under the, under the supervision of correctional sergeants and lieutenants. Now we're going to transition into our programs. Uh, to go into our program will be our deputy director of programs. His uh, name is Harold Wickham. Uh, deputy Director Wickham, you have it. Thank you, Director. For the record, Harold Wickham, I am the deputy director of programs for the uh, Department of Corrections. Um, good morning, Chair Yeager, distinguished committee, 
it's a privilege to be back before the legislature. Um, and this year I'm taking on a new role, a more proactive role as the deputy director of programs. So I'm gonna provide just a brief overview of what the NDOC group is doing in our programs division. <clears throat> Currently the NDOC is working uh, with many of our community partners to provide opportunities for offenders to be successful when they return to the communities. And that also returns them with dignity, self-esteem, vocational skills, and uh, family reunification. That's uh, pretty much what our re-entry department is about. Our education uh, division, they've done a stellar job this year. Despite COVID, um, they've worked with the uh, Department of Education, NDE, uh, the System of Higher Education, uh, eight school districts, several colleges to provide pathways for educational opportunities. And, and if you look at your slide, it'll show you some of the accomplishments um, that, that we've uh, been able to do. Just even despite COVID, we've managed to still do 494 high school diplomas in the 1920 session, uh, I say session, school year, 190 vocational certificates, 179 uh, offenders that are currently enrolled in college, and uh, 254 uh, high school equivalents. So I think we're, we're, we're really maximizing our efforts there. Uh, we hope to do better this year because it's my hope that uh, COVID will start to wane off. Um, and then our substance abuse team uh, continues to be the therapeutic communities providing uh, necessary treatment for offenders, counseling, as well as substance abuse education. And then the same with our mental health division. They're providing um, uh, assessments, treatment, counseling, as well as therapy. Uh, inpatient as well as outpatient uh, groups are being done. And then lastly, our offender management division uh, continues to enhance offenders classifications, uh, placement, statistical data, and also working on our management variables uh, for greater efficiencies uh, throughout our offender management division. Um, and that's just the, the overview. If you have any questions, I'm certainly open for those. Uh, and I'll turn this back over to Director Daniels. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director Wickham. I appreciate that. Now we're going to transition into what I had listed as general, if you're following along. And there will be two of us presenting in this particular slide. It'll be myself and also our Inspector General, uh, uh, Kendall Jones. So the Office of the Inspector General will work with the Correctional Institutional Staff to identify and prosecute offenders engaged in continuing criminal enterprises. This is extraordinarily important for us as we think this is an area that we can do a much better job in and our Inspector General's team has geared up to make this happen. So I'll turn this over at this point to Inspector General Jones. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is James Kendall Jones, the Inspector General for the Nevada Department of Corrections. As Director Charles Daniels indicated earlier in his strategic planning pledge, uh, number four, the area number four is crime interdiction. Uh, the Office of the Inspector General and the institutions are going to uh, interdict crime based on intelligence and evidence that will be gathered by correctional officers working task based posts. Information obtained by conducting cell searches, monitoring inmate phone calls, and interacting with offenders will pro be provided to the criminal investigators. Some examples of continuing criminal enterprises in a correctional center are extortion of other offenders and their families, sex trafficking of other inmates and civilians, drug introduction in cells, and introduction of phones and other contraband. Uh, I'd like to take this time to turn back over, this back over to Director Charles Daniels. Thank you, Inspector General Jones. So at this portion, if you've been following along, you'll notice that there's a screen that says questions. And so I Humbly await any questions anyone on the committee may have. Thank you so much, uh, Director Daniels uh, and your staff. We appreciate the information and um, the presentation as well. Thank you for providing that in writing. Uh, we do have a number of questions and I have some as well, but I'm going to reserve mine because I have a feeling that my committee is going to ask them all before I do, which always makes me happy when that's the way things go. So um, I'm gonna start first with Vice Chair Wynn. Hi there, Rochelle Wynn, Assembly District 10. 
Um, thank you for your presentation, Director Daniels. I know that we have worked a lot during the interim together on several different committees, including the Sentencing Commission and the ACAJ. So I appreciate your time coming here today. I have some questions. I know that I can't remember who spoke with it just recently about some of the programming that um, occurs for incarcerated individuals. So I'm wondering, um, in light of COVID, what programming was limited, what programming ceased, um, what kind of limitations they had. I know that programming is tied into good time credit and obviously rehabilitation and training um, upon release from um, these institutions. So I was wondering if you could kind of provide a little bit more detail about that and what kind of things might help your institutions in allowing people to continue in some of this programming in light of a pandemic. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Wynn. This is Director Daniels. I will turn this over to Deputy Director Wickham. Uh, good morning, for the record, Harold Wickham, Deputy Director of Programs. Uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair uh, Wynn. I appreciate that. Um, to start off with, I think we've done uh, very good job of maintaining programs as best we can. I think the things that have suffered were frankly our volunteer programs, because obviously we couldn't let volunteers into the facilities um, due to COVID restrictions, but we've managed to find ways to continue with our ongoing programs, therapeutic communities, um, using our COVID protocols. Albeit uh, we've had to scale some things down, uh, we've not stopped. We've continued with providing education, as much vocation as possible, but again, that's something that we've had to scale down based on our COVID protocols. Um, things we could use to, that would help us, and, and I think we've all realized this through COVID-19, is technologies. Um, we've got to provide uh, modern technologies in our correctional uh, division to provide classes, albeit um, distance learning or even, uh, you know, other devices, whatever, we've got to find better mechanisms um, when we find ourselves restricted and can't bring our volunteers and instructors in. We have been able to bring in educators, but very, very limited uh, on the educators. They're mostly coming in because they're providing um, packets for the offenders to work on for their school studies, and then they have to come back and get those packets, as well as they have to do assessments and testing. Uh, so we've just recently opened up for a very few a limited amount of educators to come in and uh, do assessments on the offenders as well as the, their testing uh, and things like that. Um, so we're, we're, we're still maintaining, just we'd like to do more, obviously, um, but we're doing the best we can with the resources we have. And you also mentioned good time credits. Uh, we're working with the director as well as offender management to find ways to provide meritorious credit to the offenders because unfortunately they've missed meritorious credits based on the fact of, of COVID restrictions, not being able to do their, their, their work. So our offender management division is really working on working on a robust project to possibly give the offenders up to 90 credits um, because they've missed those credits. But again, that's a work in progress. I'm sure we'll be reporting back on that uh, throughout the session. And uh, so I'm open to your question, Pam. Chair, may I follow up? Yes, please go ahead. Um, with respect to, um, you said to added technology. I know that a lot of state agencies and municipalities were able to utilize care dollars in order to upgrade a lot of their systems to allow for um, virtual meetings um, such as this. Um, is that something that you were able to utilize? Is that included in your budget in order to incorporate more digital learning and more digital rehabilitation? I know a lot of the volunteers were not able to come in to do counseling and AA and NA and that kind of stuff, but were you able to utilize those virtual technologies to be able to continue on with those therapies and treatments? Vice Chair Wynn, this is Director Daniels. Uh, as you, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, we had to ex uh, expend an extraordinary amount of CARES Act money just primarily on the medical end, and that sum was substantial. 
And so we did not focus on uh, using the CARES funding for uh, medical, I'm sorry, for educational pursuits. We literally had to ensure that we had enough uh, medical on hand. As members that are watching, uh, I'm pretty sure you understand that our operations are 24 seven. We have over 10,000 inmates and many of them came to us uh, sick. They've had problems with uh, drug abuse and or alcohol consumption. Many of them did not take care of themselves. So we have a large percentage of what I would consider to be a vulnerable uh, population. And so anything that we were able to receive went almost entirely towards dealing with the medical portion. But uh, in answering the question a little bit further, that is uh, bringing technology to bear to assist us in the future is very high on our strategic plan. And we're going to work with anyone and everyone that will help us ensure that we can bring more digital opportunities as well as uh, utilize, utilization of handheld devices to include the programming and also those that will help us uh, offer a uh, ecosystem for whatever, for various programmings and not just the school, but also the vocational training. So we're very forward looking. We know that once we're able to get this this covert situation under somewhat control, under more control, we can transition to backing off of what we're spending on COVID and then moving forward with the other things, which are quite frankly, very high on the list. So that's where we are right now. And I would once again, love to answer any further questions you may have. Thank you. Vice Chair Wynn, any other questions at this time? No, thank so you. Okay, so I got a few other folks in the queue, just so everyone sort of knows the order we're gonna go in. Um, here's the four I've got so far. I've got uh, Assemblywoman Cohen, Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod, Assemblywoman Hansen, and Assemblywoman Gonzalez. So I'll go in that order and then we'll pick up from there. So uh, Assemblywoman Cohen, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is uh, Leslie Cohen, and I have a um, question. I and I'm sorry. I don't know if this was you, Director. I was I was looking at the um, presentation and not the screen. Um, but when you were at the strategic planning page, did did you say that you're that it's part of the plan to seek accreditation? Did I misunderstand that? No, you did not miss that. So it is my long-term goal to get accreditation for multiple reasons. Uh, however, we currently do not have the funding and we're aware of that. So the reason that I noted it is that there are many, we're very aware of what the accreditation standards are. They're published nationwide. All corrections agencies from the Federal Bureau of Prisons down to the smallest state are not only aware of them, but many of the organizations uh, are actually accredited. I've been accredited for about 30 years of my life and that serves as the industry standard like is in any other. So since right now funding is tight and we're, I mean, we got to take care of the kids. We got to take care of our seniors. We got to take care of this education piece. I believe that we can still be accredited or prepare for accreditation by putting in place what we can put in place, um, especially if it's low to no cost. So my desire is to ensure that when, as we move forward, and if we want a much more professional organization uh, and we're up with what everyone else is doing at a minimum because of our accreditation standards, no different than the FAA would have standards, you're building homes, you're an electrician, you're a home builder. We have those as well, but this is an industry. And so the answer is yes, we're going to pursue it, but for the, for the items that we just cannot afford, number one, I would have to obviously seek approval, which I do not have at this time. But I certainly believe as we move forward and we take care of more of our acute issues, it is my goal at some point in time, based on my knowledge and expertise and experience, which now is roughly about 35 years, we can make that transition. And furthermore, I'm not looking for, I'm not looking at just being like everyone else. Uh, there is no reason we in this state can't be leaders in corrections. Here's what I can tell you about my team. They're very, very dedicated. My officers are bright. Uh, their level of commitment is ridiculous. They put up with a lot and we're quite frankly the forgotten team out there. Public servants, we never shut down, we're 24 seven. And no matter what, we've got to open our doors and deal with a lot of individuals, quite frankly, who have no desire to be there. Nonetheless, we can be better, we will be better and we're gonna chart that course. And I do believe that we can get there over time. 
But right now, costs are significant. I don't have any approvals to increase costs to do it. And I don't want to give a false impression, but it is a desire. As I told you, we were talking about our current snapshot, but also was talking about our vision. And there lies our vision, that accreditation piece. I hope that answered your question. Uh, thank you. Well, um, uh, Chair, follow up. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, so, so I guess it's something that I, I, I don't recall ever discussing accreditation and uh, prison accreditation. So, is this something that um, we had as a state and we the, or the department had and lost at some point? Is it something that? Um, you know, can you just give us more information about accreditation in general? Is it something that um, the vast majority of other states have and we're only one of a handful that doesn't? Or is it something that it's very rare for states to have? And, and so if we got it, it would be very exceptional for us to get or, you know, what are the surrounding states like? Um, can you just give us more information about that? Absolutely. So. The American Correctional Association has been around since the, the late 1800s. And as in with any industry, whether it's policing, whether it's, once again, shipbuilding, they're just industry standards. Or there are, those are the folks that actually maintain, identify, and come out and inspect and ensure that you're able to do it. The benefit to it, though, it especially extends to court so that when, let's just say we have an issue and someone's challenging our procedures and it gets to court, we can say, listen, we, even if we made a mistake, we typically operate within the auspices of the, of, of the National Accrediting Association. And due to that, we know that this is the latest. We desire and we always want to pursue being uh, accredited and operating with an industry norm. And when we step outside of it, we can identify what we're going to do to fix it and get it back on track. Sometimes it's training, sometimes it's technology, sometimes it's whatever. But the benefit to it is that, number one, we are seeking to grow our workforce as corrections professionals, not just Nevada corrections professionals, but corrections professionals. So right now, a lot of our policies and procedures and regulations are based on what somebody thought was a good idea or seemed to be decent. And many of our policies and regulations are first class. However, in many instances, they are not more to industry standards or industry best practices. We want to be able to make that transition because once we make that transition, then we can move forward and get into the more advanced issues, which is very near and dear to me. And that's having an impact, a significant impact on the criminal justice system, uh, racial injustice, things of that nature. But we've got to start with the inmate and ensure that when an individual leaves our organization, that there's a high probability not a possibility, but we give them some training. When an individual leaves us, he's prepared to get back out in that society. He will have already secured a position in which he has a livable wage. He will have a, uh, an industry certificate like an ASC or a driver's license, a CDL, or walk out with a degree. And we plan to ensure that this works because we want to partner with uh, various companies. Let me just give an example. I don't make up a name because I don't want to give anyone a uh, disadvantage. For instance, so Ajax Trucking. Well, you come and you bring your equipment, you teach our guys, then not only will you teach them uh, how not only to drive, and we'll have a team that goes outside and they learn how to drive, but in addition to that, we will ensure that you have your CDL on your last day, and instead of reporting to a halfway house, you report to a job site and your new residence, because you've had an opportunity to work that out with your company. So what's in it to the in the company? Well, we want to serve companies and industries in which they have a large transient policy uh, work group uh, or employment group, and you want something more permanent. You want guys who really want the job, not guys that'll take the job. Well, we should be able to supply that. And let's just say one of our inmates gets out, he doesn't do too well, we'll bring you back on in, but we've got somebody to take that place. So that'll stabilize your workforce. So our goal is if we want to have a legitimate impact on the taxpayer. For instance, this guy gets out, he's ready to go. He's got a job. Hopefully we've encouraged him and he's still interested in maintaining and strengthening his family ties. He goes out, he gets a job, he's got some dignity. 
He's ready to go. He can bring his family along. And at some point in time, he'll get off of the roles of having the government to pay for him and his offspring and so on. So it's a win-win for everyone. But our inmate has to leave our confines with skills. And he also has to leave our confines with the ability and the desire to go out there and be a part of productive society and leave that bad portion of his life behind. So it's a collective effort. We also want to work with the unions. We know that I can't speak for the unions, but I'll tell you what, they have many people that can no longer work. So my thing is, listen, if you guys have journeymen who want to serve as journeymen and maybe teach our people how to, you know, uh, play gravel, how to do whatever it is, being plumbing, there's a lot of those folks who can't work because of injuries, but they're not so disabled that they can't work. You come in, you teach our guys when our guys get out, hey, we will never compete with anybody else in the public, but if there's jobs that the average person doesn't want, and let me give an example, somewhere way out in the boonies or in the woods and where uh, the climate's inhospitable or such, a journeyman's, uh, a, a journeyman's a journeyman. We send these guys out, they finish their apprenticeship program, then they get jobs with livable wages, and now we've created an environment and a way moving forward to help these inmates move on. And the ultimate goal to that is to not only have them prepared, but reduce the amount of inmates that are actually in prison. I can't do anything about the enforcement end or the prosecutorial end, but I can do something with the imprisonment portion and the reentry went in. And then once I hand these folks off to any form of supervision, whether it be parole and or probation, there's a much greater probability of success. And then as a state, we'll see many more of our inmates not be funneled just out and then come back. But our guys will be out, they'll stay out, and we will serve as a model for not only those in our state, but other states as well. So I don't have an interest in being like everyone. I have an interest in making meaningful societal change. And my team that I currently have assembled, this group of people are 100% all in. I, I would not have accepted the job if uh, the governor had not expressed that he wants meaningful change. He wants us to make a difference, to do it right. And so all of this would have already been in play if we didn't have to deal with COVID. I would have, I would have uh, sought uh, approval from the governor's team. And then but for the things that we could do, we would do. But I'm here to tell you, all of the members, which is why I thought uh, everyone could see our presentation, I had a visual of all of our executive team, because you will see them. Every committee member will see them because we want more. We're going to be aggressive about it, but we will not hurt our community. But uh, we have to do better. I do not accept that this is just a dead end and there's nothing we can do. There's a lot we can do and we want to be at the forefront of it. I hope I addressed your question. Um, Director Daniels, I appreciate that. And I don't think anyone doubts your commitment, but um, I'm going to give Assemblywoman Cohen a chance because I, I don't, you said a lot, but I don't think you answered her questions uh, about the history of accreditation. So I'm just going to give her a chance to maybe ask those questions uh, simply and, and try to get an answer on them. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and yes, I, I agree. I think we, we do understand your passion and your interest for keeping the, the state safe and for having the inmates uh, be successful when they return to the community and to their families. Uh, but so yes or no, was Nevada accredited at one point and lost that accreditation? The answer is no, to my knowledge. Uh, we have never been accredited and um, and speaking with the former director and such, he's been a member of ACA for years, so have I. But the issue has, from my understanding, has just been funding, and there's just always been other priorities, and it is fairly expensive to get the accreditation. So as far as I'm aware, and once again, I did research, but uh, the state of Nevada has never been accredited. And uh, so moving forward, that's something we will see. But I'm very mindful of the priorities that are already presented uh, the employment issues and such with the state. And since it is expensive, I do want to be a good steward of the taxpayers' money because a lot of what we need to do to be accredited, we can do without the accreditation. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, Chair, just I can get the rest of the answer, please. Um, and then just yes or no is, um, are the majority of other states accredited? The answer is I don't know it's because it fluctuates. Uh, at one point in time, for instance, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, yes, the, ma the majority, I could speak for that as a member of it. But now I'm not so sure because recently several states, because of funding issues, have either chosen not to be reaccredited or reaccredited or 
um, no longer seek to maintain their accreditation. Thank you. And Director Daniels, I hope you don't think those questions are, are, are aimed at you in any sort of negative light. We're just trying to get information. I obviously know um, the department as well as other executive agencies are under tremendous budget strain. So we're certainly sympathetic uh, to the fact that you can't do what you need to do. We don't fund you to do it. So uh, please don't take it any other way than us just trying to get a picture of, of where we are as a state. And I think we all appreciate your commitment, your team's commitment to being the best and going above and beyond whatever the accreditation is. So I just want to make sure you don't take our questions the wrong way. We're just trying to get information. Um, uh, excuse me, Chairman Yeager. Uh, now, I, I misspoke somewhat. Prison Industries has been accredited. You know, that's their own, its own separate corporation, but they're part of the Department of Corrections. So they have since, I believe, 2002. Yeah. I'm sorry, since 2000. Now, in terms of just I love the questions. This is an opportunity for me. I am having the time of my life. So no, please ask away. I want okay, to answer great. the question. Great. So no, I just I just wanted to make sure that that you knew we weren't we weren't attacking you in any way. We're all having to deal with this budget crisis. So um, we have a few more questions. So I'm going to keep moving us along. I'm going to go next to Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axelrod, and I just was wondering if you could give the committee an update on the youth incarcerated at Lovelock and for the new members or members of the public who might not be familiar, there has been an issue in the past with teenage offenders ability to participate in education and counseling uh, and other things like that. So if we could give an update on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. I will turn this question over to Deputy Director Harold Wickham, who was recently in charge of that program. Deputy Director Wickham. For the record, Harold Wickham, uh, thank you for the uh, question, Assembly Rulman uh, Bilberry Axelrod. Um, to my knowledge, we currently have, I, I want to say it's 11, but please don't quote me on that. I think it's between 9 and 11 youth offenders. Uh, currently incarcerated at the Lovelock Correctional Facility. We have been able to enhance what we do with them by providing in-classroom education. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot more. Uh, last session, we worked with the ACLU and several others um, to attempt to do a, uh, a study of, of where we're at with the youth programs. Um, ideally, I think, uh, we can all agree youth shouldn't be in an adult prisons. It's not it's not the most productive environment for them. And it restricts our abilities of what we can and can't do because the population, frankly, is so small and uh, we're not funded for it. Um, but that being said, uh, I, I think we do a, a good job with what we have. Uh, and I look forward to doing more. Uh, I hope that answered your question, ma'am. Yes, thank, thank you. Well, I'll, we'll dive deeper uh, later, but I know a lot of people have questions, so thank you. Okay, let's go next to Assemblywoman Hansen. Hi, this is Assemblywoman Alexis Hansen, District 32, and thank you all for being here for your presentation. And um, actually, I, I kind of have two questions, but then maybe when I finish getting my questions answered, Director Daniels, if you could maybe tell us, I know that you're uh, uh, new to this, um, at least as far as the last session, I think we had a different director. And I know, and I think we're all sympathetic that you have inherited a lot of really tough issues. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and um, why we're glad that you have enthusiasm to take on this huge task. But two questions first. Um, have we always had an inspector general position in Department of Corrections? The answer is yes. Since 1996. Okay, thank you. And then regarding the Hep C um, and and that big issue, I I I looked at your presentation on the Nellis website as as you guys were speaking, and so you've. You've requested for the budget $6 million because the vaccines are very expensive, $17,000, if I'm not mistaken, per patient. And you have 166 that are top priority right now. 
So that's about 2 million. Do you, I, I have a constituent who's very connected to this and has kept me apprised of what's going on. I'm familiar with the lawsuit. Um, they had a relative die in the in last April from the hep C um, and needed to get the vaccine, but couldn't get it because the state didn't have the money or they wouldn't pay for it. So I'm just looking to understand how you're going to be able to manage this while you're waiting for some funding. What about those top priority of 166 and 2 million to do that now? Um, if you could just kind of give us a, an update of where you are with managing, this is a pretty big problem in, in the prison population. Oh, hi, Assemblywoman uh, Hanson. This is uh, Michael Mina, direct, uh, Medical Director for Nevada Department of Corrections. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, yes, uh, starting the hepatitis C treatment for our inmates has been an immense challenge, obviously, during the pandemic. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is uh, not only uh, in terms of the logistics of uh, getting our inmates seen via telemed, which is the primary uh, medium in which we have our inmates being seen because of the pandemic, uh, but also due to uh, the uh, sometimes delays in getting um, uh, testing uh, for our inmates. For instance, uh, most, uh, most, all of these inmates in the, the priority one category um, have uh, severe uh, liver disease and they require ultrasounds before uh, initiating treatment or at least during the first uh, a portion of the 84 day, uh, days of treatment. Uh, so one of the issues that we've had is the, uh, the difficulty in uh, sending our inmates uh, out to the community to get uh, these ultrasounds uh, performed as uh, a lot of the medical centers throughout the state have been um, uh, you know, rescheduling a lot of uh, imaging, such as ultrasounds because of the pandemic, uh, also delaying uh, elective types of procedures like that. Uh, what we are trying, uh, what we have an ongoing um, efforts to partner with Hope's Clinic in Reno uh, to provide telemedicine opportunities so that we can have our inmates seen. Um, and that is something that's ongoing. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, the, the treatment for uh, the, uh, the medication, uh, the most popular medication is Inclusa, which is a medication that covers all genotypes of hepatitis C. And uh, that does have a range of cost between approximately sixteen to $22,000. And there, are, there is a, a variability depending on uh, which pharmacy uh, provides a medication. If, if I could share, um, thank you for the indulgence, follow up with that a little bit. Please go um, ahead. And so when you mentioned Hope's Clinic, which that would be a great partnership, has there been any thought, and I don't know if it's appropriate, you know, I my concern is the people that are incarcerated, they still need access to good medical care. Uh, regardless of their crimes, that's a human right. And so, and I, but I know we have a cost factor, we have a pandemic, all of that. Is there any possibility to partner, and maybe once the pandemic starts to ease up, with with the university, uh, you know, the med schools, um, and have some of these med students be involved in, in some of the processes, so that we can make sure. And I don't know if it's appropriate to take them there or to have the students come to the prison to the, you know, if you have an on-site infirmary. Um, I'm just looking for ways that we can expand access. Access to healthcare is difficult in, in the population that are not incarcerated. So I, I just am hoping that, and I'm, I'm reaching out to say, I've been connected to this issue for some constituents and I've been disturbed by some of the things that have happened. And so I want to be a, a, of an ability to help in some way and I know so much is tied to funding and, and a lot of other complicated things, but just know that if there's some way that I can be involved in discussions, um, please bring me in to them. And uh, again, I'm just wondering about accessing and using some of our medical students in, in this enterprise. Uh, Assemblywoman Hanson, thank you very much for your question. Uh, we have explored, uh, you know, uh, having uh, 
uh, sorry, students from the medical schools uh, at UNR, also UNLV, to uh, come to our facilities to uh, to see our patients and, and participate in the the treatment of our inmates. Uh, one of the hurdles that we have is that uh, it, it's an accreditation issue, uh, so that uh, the uh, American uh, College, it's ACGME, which is American College of General Medical Medical Education, has to accredit uh, the facilities. Uh, in which we are able to provide the, uh, the teaching opportunities for those students. Um, and that was something that we had uh, kind of discussed uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, so that, that's one hurdle. Um, and I think if, if we, we get that uh, ACGME accreditation in combination, I think with ACA, that there is a very real possibility that we could have uh, medical students from our medical schools throughout the state participate in the treatment of our inmates. Uh, before the pandemic, we had um, explored um, the use of uh, mobile medical clinics. Uh, there was a uh, medical group out of Utah that was uh, actually interested in providing uh, mobile medical clinics. Basically, it would be a, uh, a large semi-trailer that was able to house um, not only treatment suites for uh, for, for our patients and our inmates at, at our different facilities, but uh, they were even uh, thinking of even uh, having surgical suites within these mobile units to actually provide um, a surgical procedures, colonoscopies, imaging in a mobile unit that could be actually placed at uh, several of our major facilities throughout the state. Unfortunately, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, obviously got in the way of, the, of those negotiations, but that's something that's very much on my mind because I think that's uh, in combined with getting the medical students throughout the state uh, to participate in the care of our inmates uh, definitely can raise the, the ability of the harbor our inmates to, to get the uh, necessary medical care uh, at, in, in a timely manner. Thank you. I appreciate that update and, and wish you well in, in this work. And then perhaps uh, Director Daniels, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came to take on this big job. Well, absolutely. After uh, exiting the United States Air Force in 1988 out in the Los Angeles area, I was attempting to get on either with the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration and or LAPD or LA Sheriff's Department. But it just so happened that at that exact time, while I'd gone through the processing of, of all of them and I was just waiting for an academy date, uh, we had a significant recession back in 88 of some of you folks may be too young to remember. And so what they did was they retarded all the reporting dates. And so there lies, I'm without a job. <laughs> so what I did was I applied. I remember the Bureau of Prisons at a job fair and I applied and they called me right away and said, hey, listen, we're not all over hiring, we're hiring right away. And the reason we're doing something is because we expect our inmate population to increase exponentially due to the Sentence Reform Act and the Comprehensive Control Crime Act of 1986. And based on that, they needed to have people on right away. So I hired on with them while I was, of course, trying to wait and see what's going to happen. But what I found that when I joined as a correctional officer, I actually enjoyed it. This was fun. There's that little tinge of excitement on a regular basis. And I enjoyed being immersed around a lot of staff who have to care about one another, take care of one another, very similar to the military. My father was in the military and all the males in our family since the uh, 40s have served in the military in one way, form, fashion, or another, so I did my piece. But I just seemed to find a nice fit. And then the organization said, listen, if, if you want to apply yourself and you're willing to move, uh, you can go as far as you want. So I was in maybe, I was in my first year, I became a supervisor, I like to believe, because it was hard work and dedication, but the actual actuality of it was, I cared and I wanted to make a difference. And that stayed with me along the way. And then, uh, and I started in 1988, in 2002, I made warden at the uh, Federal Correctional Institution in Sheridan, Oregon. And then I uh, went to central office as a senior deputy assistant director of industries, education and vocational training, which is my passion for the, uh, the peace on reentry. 
And, and then I went back out and I was the warden at the, in Florence, Colorado at the United States Penitentiary there. Many people have heard about it, of course, with the supermax inmates and things of that nature. And the inmates there were, uh, quite frankly, a who's who of, uh, let's say, criminals you know. Then after that, I left and I went to uh, Omaha, Texas. And I, I, I didn't want to leave Colorado, but I went because we're having some significant in incidents down there. And that penitentiary in the complex lost their designation as a penitentiary. And it was because it was out of control, and then they were designated a medium. It was my job to bring it back. I did. I was successful. Then I transitioned on into the uh, United States, I'm sorry, the Federal Correctional Complex in Terre Haute, Indiana, which houses our largest terrorist unit and houses our death row and other little subgroups. And so I was extraordinarily pleased. I retired on December 31st of 2016, and on December 17th, I assumed position of senior deputy. Uh, Commissioner of Corrections in New York. I stayed there for a little while. It wasn't a good fit. And uh, then I went down to Alabama as uh, Deputy Commissioner of Operations. I ran day-to-day -day operations of uh, the Corrections Department down there. And then while there, I, I, I was informed that there may be a position out here in, uh, out here in Nevada. Now, when I retired from the Bureau of Prisons, I made my home in Henderson. So having said that, uh, you just couldn't have asked for a better, a better opportunity. So I came out, I applied, I interviewed, and I was fortunate enough to be selected by Governor Sislak and his team. So that is my journey. I am 100% uh, in love with corrections because it's the people business. And I wanted to do something with my life in which I had passion and I wanted to change lives. And I really had an interest in changing the trajectory of so many people that come to jail or prison as a young person and they just enter this cycle of despair and they can't shake it. So I wanted to be a change agent. Uh, I extraordinarily pleased with the position on the governor. We've got to make a change. We've got to do this right. We've got to stop this cycle. So I jumped in all in. I am a retiree of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So my, uh, my work is, quite frankly, it's just a choice. But unless they kick me out, I'm staying. This is great. It's wonderful. It's challenging. The people I work with are extraordinary. I love working with my wardens and my, my teams, my staff out there, and we're on a move. We want to make some change. So there lies a brief journey around the uh, Charles Daniels uh, work history and movement on us. Thank you, Director Daniels, for, for that. I think that's helpful to know. Uh, where you've been and uh, we've heard from you where you hope to go. So we obviously hope to take that journey with you uh, to having the best uh, Department of Corrections in the country. Um, I have a couple more questions, I think. So I want to go next to Assemblywoman Gonzalez to ask uh, a question or two. Hello, thank you so much, Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16. Um, I have two questions that are just clarification. Um, number one, I can't recall, are vaccines mandated for staff? And then the second question is, have any incarcerated persons received the vaccine? I think you said that the consent form is currently circulating. So I was just curious when they will be receiving the vaccine as well. Okay, I will turn this over to the first portion to Chief of our Human Resources, which is uh, Christina Leathers. And then the second portion will be addressed by our medical director, Dr. Michael Manette. Good morning. Um, Chair Yeager to Assemblywoman Gonzalez. This is Christina Leathers, Chief Human Resource Officer. Um, we are, currently do not have vaccines mandated for staff. We have been in discussions with the Attorney General's office. Um, and at this time, we don't um, feel that it's appropriate to mandate it at this time. Um, but we are keeping that option open should we have to do it in the future. Dr. Manette. Uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, this is uh, Michael Manette, Medical Director for NDOC. Uh, to my knowledge, we only have one inmate that has been vaccinated at this time. It's an inmate at Ely, and they were uh, uh, vaccinated under, under the authority of the uh, local uh, uh, medical officer uh, in the uh, White Pine County. Uh, so at this time, uh, we actually have been getting some good information in terms of the, the percentages of inmates that are interested in vaccination throughout the state. Uh, our preliminary data shows that, that Southern Desert 
um, approximately over 60% of the inmates are interested in vaccination. Um, at Florence McClure, uh, which is the women's prison, uh, it's about 24%. Um, at Warm Springs, uh, up in uh, Carson City, it's about approximately 50% of the inmates are interested in getting vaccine. Uh, at Lovelock Correctional Center, um, it's approximately 69% of the inmates interested in getting vaccination. Um, at NNCC, uh, also in Carson City, that's a part, it's approximately 41% of the inmates are interested in vaccination. And we're still uh, compiling um, data from High Desert and uh, Casa Grande and Gene Conservation Camp at this time. But so far, we've had a, a very uh, a robust um, interest amongst the inmates in uh, receiving the COVID-19 vaccination, uh, which is uh, very good news. Uh, Mr. Manev, can I ask um, those numbers you just gave for the inmates? Uh, for those institutions was that uh, did 100 percent of the inmates respond like yes or no or were there some inmates that just didn't respond one way or the other to the inquiry uh to my knowledge uh, not all of the inmates responded uh we, this is just kind of a preliminary data that we've received uh but i can definitely get back to you with more uh detailed data as, as we go forward Great, thank you. And then because we were on the topic, I did want to ask uh, quickly about the staff side. Um, certainly understand the answer that staff are not being required to be vaccinated, but I think you'd indicated 33% of the staff had been uh, vaccinated. I just wondered if you had any kind of estimate about what the final percentage would be, I guess, meaning of the 67% remaining in staff, is there some percent known percentage of those people who have indicated they want the vaccine? but just haven't gotten it yet? Hi, this is Director Daniels, and I'll address the question. So the numbers that we have are individuals that either tested on site or volunteered to tell us that they uh, went downtown and or in the, to the county, depending on where they live, and got the test. The problem with it, we know that our baseline is the minimum, but they're quite frankly probably many more because they don't have to report it to us. And we have, uh, and many of our staff have just chosen not to say one way or the other. Why? It's just personal preference and they don't want the government knowing their personal information. So the information that we have is what we can verify, but we suspect that there's probably quite a few more that just went and did it on their own. And then uh, I, I can tell you what has happened with our staff. As the more staff they get it, the more that didn't get it, they go up and they want their opportunity. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my executive team uh, went up to Ely State Prison yesterday and we got our second one and we did it in front of our staff. And then we had many more staff saying, well, shoot, if the director and the deputy director get it, I'm gonna get mine too. And they appreciated the fact that we went up and we, took, uh, we got the vaccine. Now, as it relates to the other facilities, what's happening is, is now our deputy directors, as well as our wardens, are getting the test and they're encouraging everyone. So right now the level of encourage, encouragement to get the vaccine has uh, has been very strong. I'm making a agency tour along with many of my executive team and we're having uh, we're having town halls and we're, we're just flat out talking about it. I typically take Dr. Manav or somebody from medical and we're talking about the efficacy, the information that we get from the CDC on the governor's calls things of that nature and where to get information if you want to independently verify what's going on. But I'm starting to see a critical mass in some of these facilities where we've gone and we've gone twice. And, and now folks in many respects just want to get it. And the few that don't, they're talking about uh, underlying conditions. And so, so the number that you have, it may seem somewhat Spartan, but the numbers are actually better. We know, but we decided we made a conscious decision. If we didn't, Get it and we couldn't get it confirmed from an individual that we didn't list it as a confirmed test. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. Thank you for that clarification. I understand that um, uh, sometimes people just don't tell you. So, you know, thank you for that. That I think that illuminates that number. Um, I do want to go back to Assemblywoman Gonzalez, who I believe had a follow up question. So, thank you for allowing me to jump in there and ask a couple. Go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Chair. Um, for the record, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, Assembly District 16. I just had a follow up question on the rollout of vaccinations for incarcerated persons. What does that look like? At what point will you have all the information that inmates, or I'm sorry, incarcerated persons want to be vaccinated? And then at that point, what is their wait time to receive that vaccine? Uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, thank you very much for your question. This is Michael Minow, Medical Director. Uh, at this time, uh, we have been uh, trying to emphasize uh, the importance to our staff to get the vac vaccination uh, because of their um, constant interfacing with the community um, and they are obviously at the highest risk for bringing COVID-19 into our facilities. Um, we would like uh, very much if we could get herd immunity amongst our staff. Uh, that's a very bold uh, number. We'd have to get above 80% of our staff to reach her, her level of immunity, uh, which is essentially enough of the uh, staff being vaccinated that it would reduce the transmission uh, and, and incidence of, of COVID-19 in our facilities. Uh, we expect to continue gathering information from our inmates from all our facilities statewide. And we are uh, at this time uh, looking at a, a March 1st uh, date to start vaccination of our inmates. Uh, statewide. Thank you so much. Hey, I have a, a couple of questions I'm, I'm going to ask in a minute. We only have about 15 minutes before we have to go to public comment to make sure we can all get to the floor on time. But I wanted to make sure that there weren't other committee members that had questions before I asked a couple. So I think I've got you all on the Hollywood Squares view and just uh, wave your hand if you have a question or want to ask one. Um, Okay, I don't see any. So let me just ask a couple before we close out here, if you don't mind, Director. And, you know, one of the first ones, I think we talked about areas we can improve as a state. And I think hopefully we can agree that one of the areas we can improve on is, is our uh, population of, of female incarcerated persons um, who largely in, in our state tend to be more on the, the nonviolent side and, you know, I think have unique um, I guess unique issues or unique needs that are separate and apart from the predominantly male population in the prison. So my question was just, you know, what is what does the landscape look like for improving services for our female population for getting them uh, ready to transition out into the community if you could kind of give me uh, just a snapshot of what the vision is to improve in that area. Thank you, Chair Yeager. This is uh, Director Daniels. I too agree with you that I think it would be great to reduce that population because the vast majority are nonviolent. Uh, I think that, and we can also do better, although we are addressing it, uh, the criminogenic needs of a female offender as opposed to a male offender. Having said that, I um, uh, I, I enjoyed the interaction in the, with the volunteers and so on, but I think we also need to ensure that while we're addressing those needs that deal with issues of uh, uh, violence perpetrated against those people and or maybe the trauma of the loss of kids and so on or the victimization that they would typically receive from a male on the outside before committing a crime typically induced by the male. So I know I believe we need to focus more and more and it is my goal at some point to look at our local colleges and, and to see whatever they have but also as it relates to American Correctional Association and then I see they're very connected with uh, folks that are involved in trying to deal with these specific uh, issues that have an impact on female offenders. Uh, it is to my goal, you know, by the time we get them, it's a female offender. Of course, there was the enforcement folks that did it. Then you have the folks that are involved, obviously, in the uh, prosecution. Then you have the judges will deal with the uh, judicial piece, and then we get them at that point. I would like just societally to see a shift in less prison sentence and especially if someone has a child and they haven't been violent, I'd like to see a lot more of that deal, but outside the scope of imprisonment. But once again, you have to, each judge takes it individually and, and they said it's accordance to what the, obviously the statutes indicate, as well as what they believe the complicity to be of the crime. So I agree. Uh, we are also talking about as it relates to our reentry programs for the things that we offer large and largely in part to males we also want to offer largely in part to females. Right now, we have a very strong program as it relates to uh, the cosmetology piece and things of that nature. But 
I think we need to open up more opportunities and the uh, females down at Gene as well as uh, Florence McClure have both indicated they wanted other opportunities other than the traditional opportunities typically afforded to female offenders. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And you know, obviously I'm sympathetic to the, the budget crunch we're in, but hopefully um, in future cycles, you'll be able to ask for some of those enhancements and be able to get them because I, th I think it is important. Um, you know, the last question I have, and it might be kind of uh, an unexpected one, but um, I was in this building back in 2015. I, I wasn't elected at the time, but I remember, um, I believe it was the Ways and Means Committee or the fi uh, Finance Committee, it, they approved a capital improvement project for uh, basically a, a new execution chamber out at Ely State Prison. Um, of course, uh, nobody's been executed in the state since that chamber was constructed. So my question was just what, what, what's happening in that space? Is it being used for something else um, or is it just kind of sitting there empty at the moment? Hi, this is uh, Director Daniels again for the record. Uh, Chairman Yeager, the facility is still there at Ely State Prison. However, it has not been utilized that I'm aware of, and uh, it's there if uh, the governor decides to move forward with a request for a death. Well, if a judge sets someone to death, then if the uh, governor approves it, then, of course, we have the facility available. Thank you for that. And I did just get notice I, I may have uh, overlooked Assemblywoman's uh, Summers Armstrong, did you have a question you wanted to ask before we let the director go? I'm sorry, I'm having technology challenges this morning. Uh, I'm going, my question has been answered. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Certainly understand the technology. We're all, we're all getting used to this world. So it's only gonna get better from here, from here I hope. And I'm sure as soon as we got it figured out, we'll be back in the regular committee room and lose all the skills shortly thereafter. Uh, but director, um, I wanna thank you and your staff for being here. You, you've spent a good amount of time with us, answered a lot of our questions. Um, we appreciate that. I'm sure that we'll be working together during the session. And I wanna encourage members to reach out directly to the director and the department with questions. And likewise, director, um, you and your team, if we can be of assistance, um, if you have concerns about bills, I mean, hopefully we're reaching out to you, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us if we can be of assistance as we go forward through this session. Uh, Chairman Yeager and Vice Chair Wynn, I just want to let you know that this has been an honor because it's an opportunity. And the more that I can communicate and share with you where we are and where we're going, our vision and so on, uh, it makes me feel better and it helps our staff out to feel, start to believe that they're understood. Many of the same issues that the members of the committee are concerned about, we are too, because all of our staff are citizens and many of these offenders will be our neighbors and we want them to have a better path forward. So no, I see this as an, as an opportunity. If anyone wants to call at any time, I'm clearly available. My executive team is available. And the one thing we will do is be responsive. Uh, we're all on the same team, trying to make our state better and do the best we can for our citizens. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm speaking on behalf of my very talented staff and those that presented information today. Have a wonderful day, Chair. Thank you, you guys too. Have a great rest of the week. Okay, so we're going to uh, close out uh, the agenda item on the presentation and that is gonna take us to uh, public comment. I, I don't know that I previewed this um, at the beginning of the meeting, but it is my intent on in Judiciary Committee meetings to uh, reserve time for public comment at the end of each meeting. Um, that public comment time will be limited to a total of 30 minutes with uh, callers having two minutes each to provide their public testimony. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our very capable and able broadcast staff to uh, queue up the first caller for public comment. Uh, BPS, do we have anyone on the public comment line? You? Uh, Hi. Yes. Here we go. 
Oh, Please sorry. Go. Hello, my name is Corey. Um, I'm here with Return Strong. Uh, yesterday, I was contacted by my younger brother after not hearing from him since Thursday. Um, he's been in prison for many years, and it's unlike him to not call for days on end, so I was worried. However, I was more concerned for his safety after his phone call than I had been before. He told me that he'd been transferred from Warm Springs Correctional Center to Ely State Prison, and it had been an extremely traumatic experience. When he arrived at Ely, he was questioned by some of the officers who kept asking what he knew about recent attacks on officers. My brother told me that he'd known something had happened at Warm Springs before he was transferred, but he didn't know exactly what. The officers at Ely cuffed his wrist so tightly that he lost feeling in his hands. He repeatedly told the officers that he didn't know anything, but they slammed him down against the floor and repeatedly beat and kicked him along with other prisoners, one of whom was only 18 years old, while they were handcuffed at their wrists and ankles. He said that the officers kept accusing him of liking to hurt officers and demanding that he, that he tell them what they, he knew. My brother didn't have anything to do with any recent acts of violence, and he didn't do anything to provoke this attack on him. He's covered in bruises on his shoulders, ribs, arms, and legs. Um, he was so afraid because he believed he was going to be killed. They all did. One of the men who was beaten along with him was so terrified that he defecated on himself, and the officers laughed when they saw what their attack had done to him. My brother is one of the lucky ones because some of the people those humans who were attacked with him had much more severe injuries. They were all denied their right to receive care or have photos taken of their injuries as verification of the assault. My brother wants nothing more than to serve his time while spreading the word of Jesus and lives his life inside those walls as peacefully as he can. We understand that someone was hurt, but this savage way of trying to get information from someone is an abuse of human rights. I am here with Return Strong to beg the state to investigate. I know this might not be the place, but maybe someone will hear and care and help. Thank you. Thank you, Am. And if before you hang up, could you could you just state and spell your full name for the record so we have it? I might have been too late. Okay, BPS, on to the next caller, please. Caller with the Good last morning. three digits, 151, there you are. Would you please uh, slowly state your name and then spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. My name is Denise Bolaño, C-E-N-I-S-E-C-O-L-A-N-O-S. Uh, I'm a member of Return Strong, Families United for Justice of the Incarcerated, and like the name implies, our goal is for the voiceless people that are incarcerated behind the walls of NDOC to have justice. We're here today to address the Assembly Judiciary Committee at the start of the session to hear Director Daniels' presentation and to remind the committee that two truths can exist at the same time. We implore you to Uh, we may I have lost the caller. I think we did. Hold on, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 499 please slowly state your name and then spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and you may begin now. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Jody Hocking, J O D I H O C K I N G. Um, I would like to thank you for your time today. I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible. My name is, oh, I already said that. <laughs> I'm the founder of Return Strong, Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated. And I was really here today to listen to Director Daniel's presentation and address the committee about our ongoing concerns regarding the power of the director, accountability, communication, and transparency. Before we get deep into the legislative session, I want to address the concerns that we have about the state's lack of oversight into the prison and the safety and conditions of our loved ones during COVID and the pandemic, 
and on a daily basis. Um, I want to make it clear that there will be legislation that impacts them, and we're asking you to listen closely because the director will tell you one side of the story that he wants you to hear. And if you're not listening and paying attention, you will completely miss that there's another side to every story. Facts do not necessarily equal the truth. And I actually really feel hopeful by the questions that the committee was asking today. Um, it is evident that you guys also do want to get to the truth. Right now, all inmates in Nevada are currently under a modified lockdown due to a series of attacks on staff over the past week. I believe there were three people that were, that were attacked. Um, first, I want to be clear that we do not condone those attacks. We're also not willing to ignore that months of abuse, neglect, degradation that have caused incarcerated people to be on the edge of despair, angry, and hopeless, literally left in their cells to die in the face of a pandemic and being mocked and ignored and abused by corrections officers did not have a part to play in this. We understand that they're all victims in their own way. COs are dealing with their stress levels and staffing shortages and being responsible, not just for safety and supervision, but now for life and death. Some handled it better than others. A few days ago, a group of inmates were moved to Ely following the attack at Warm Springs. The group was racially targeted and everyone who's moved fits a, r a racial profile, whether they were guilty or innocent. It doesn't appear that there was any care put into who was moved. Um, it was typical corrections group discipline, but the real problem happened when they got to Ely and a group of corrections officers beat them as they were handcuffed and shackled, telling them that it was for the officers injured at High Desert and Warm Springs. Those people have not received medical treatment and we're concerned that there's no repercussions for the perpetrators of those crimes. Justice isn't a one-way street. There was an abuse of power by staff that needs to be addressed immediately before the cuts and bruises heal. It wouldn't surprise me if we see continued uprising across the state. Yesterday, I was reading and I read a quote that if a soul is left in darkness, ma ma'am, could you could be one? Ma'am, could you start to wrap yep, up, please? We're right well, well beyond the two minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, we just are here today to just let you know that. We're here, we wanna like see the truth and shine a light on that and just raise the bar with Nevada that we have to do better when it comes to incarcerated people. Thank you so much. Uh, BPS, next caller, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 141 slowly restate your name and spell your name for the record and finish your statement? You were cut off uh, on your last call. You may begin now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Denise Bolaño, D-E-N-I-S-E-B-O-L-A-N-O-S. -E um, and I believe that this is where I was um, cut off last time. Um, so we are here today to address the Assembly Judiciary Committee at the start of the session to hear Director Daniel's presentation and remind the committee that two truths can exist at the same time. We implore you to make sure you take time in, in the deliberations over bills that impact incarcerated people and around policing and criminal justice reform to find that second truth. How justice is achieved varies depending on the situation, but for us, the families of incarcerated people, it simply takes shape in treating our husbands, sons, daughters, and sisters like human beings, like you would be required to if they were not incarcerated. It means to protect them from COVID and provide the necessary tools for them to be physically healthy, just as you would in your own communities. Yet, NDOC cases went from 27 to approximately 4,600 in a span of two to three months with 52 deaths. It means to preserve their familial ties by protecting contact visits and encouraging those bonds to remain intact throughout this unprecedented time so that their mental health does not suffer. Yet we are coming up on a year with no visits and no plan as to when or how they will resume and continuous phone and mail issues that strain the already fragile communication. It means providing timely and adequate medical care and nutrition, among other things that frankly, two minutes does not allow me to outline for you. By looking out for them, you're also looking out for us who are constituents of the state that you represent. And DOC states that maintaining humane and safe conditions and preparing the incarcerated for reentry is their priority for our families. But over 900 incarcerated men and women that are and their family members who make up return strong, strongly would say otherwise. We must remember that there are always two sides to every story. And if we're not willing to listen to both sides, we cannot truly say we have given justice a chance. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your public comment and feel free to provide additional public comment in writing if there were things you wanted to say but didn't get to. And uh, BPS, let's go to the next caller, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 048 slowly state your name and then spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and you may begin now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Stephen Cohen for the record, Stephen with a V, last name Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, no relation to the member. Uh, ditto, my prepared remarks should be on file, hopefully before the end of the day. I cite some specific examples to duplicate the prior speaker's remarks. Well, thank you and look forward to uh, being a resource for the committee as it progresses. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. And we do have your, um, your, your statement members. Uh, you can find that on Nellis, some additional written public comment from Mr. Cohen. And thank you, sir, for being brief uh, this afternoon or this morning, I guess. Um, BPS, do we have anybody else on the public comment line? Uh, Chairman Yeager, uh, the line is open and working. And at this time, there are no other callers. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment um, and so let me just thank uh, committee members. This is a first for Assembly Judiciary to go virtual. And um, I know it's not the way that we all envisioned this meeting running, but I wanna thank you all for uh, your cooperation today and for your attention. I know it's uh, somewhat difficult sitting in front of a computer screen. I certainly appreciate that, uh, but I, I do appreciate your diligence in being here and being active. Let me just give you a quick lay of the land for the rest of the week so you know. Uh, we do have agendas out for Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, like today, both meetings will start at 8 o'clock. Uh, some of you might be wondering why 8 o'clock. Well, you're looking, it's 10.50. So we tend to tend to go a little bit long in the committee. So I want to make sure we have enough time to get through our business. So tomorrow and Thursday, we have additional presentations. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the Department of Public Safety, Parole and Probation, and the Board of Parole Commissioners. And then Thursday, we have the Gaming Control Board and the Cannabis Control Board as well. Excuse me, the Cannabis Compliance Board. Um, Friday, we are yet to yet to be determined uh, what we might be doing on Friday, but so that's the, the lay of the land for the next two days. Um, you'll note we don't have any bills scheduled for hearing yet. I remain hopeful that we'll be able to hear some bills starting next week. We will not hear any this week, so don't be too worried about that, but hopefully next week we'll have a chance to start jumping into some bills. Uh, we will have presentations as well next week, but I hope to add some bills to the um, agenda as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, before we close out today's uh, Assembly Judiciary committee, committee meeting, is there anything else from any of our members? I have you on my gallery here. Any hands raised? I see a hand from Assemblywoman Kasama. If you want to go ahead and unmute. Here we go. Um, you said the written comment was on the Nellis. I'm looking on Nellis and I don't find it. Um, I see the, um, I certainly see the exhibits. And I see the agenda minutes, work session documents and exhibits. And I thought you had mentioned that. Yeah, you may, you may want to refresh. I think it's been put up there. So I'm looking at it now and it's the last exhibit listed. Ah. It says testimony. So I think it might've gotten loaded while we were in committee. So, so a oh. refresh might solve that problem. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And if not, just let me know. We'll make sure that um, you all get a copy of that. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, thank you. Anything else from our members? Okay, I don't see anything else. Um, again, wanna thank you all for a very productive First Assembly Judiciary Committee meeting. I will see you all tomorrow morning on this wonderful technology known as Zoom at eight o'clock. Um, Till then, have a great day. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>